Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. How'd you like that for a new intro, huh? Just mixing it up, throwing you a curveball. <laughs> That's what I like to do. Throw you a curveball. Let you know it ain't always going to be the same, man. I'm going to mix it up on your ass. Oh, let me tell you. This is a good one, ladies and gentlemen. This is a good one. Patrick from Fit for an Autopsy. I love this dude. He's a fucking great dude. Great dude. He's a homie. So yeah, you're in for a treat. You're in for an aural treat. Or maybe a visual treat. You know, if you're watching this, I guess you can't I guess a lot of people actually watch this on YouTube. It's about fifty fifty at this point. It's about fifty fifty listening on the podcast and about 50 50 on the on the visual side which is the youtube side and uh you know it's march now i'm hoping that the podcast is going to pick up you know my fucking it seems like everybody's tuned out to podcasting no matter who i get on they're tuned out end of the year was killing it but it's always slow in the beginning of the year for some reason always slow Low views are low, the listens are low. It's like people are like, I can't take anything. I'm in my post Christmas hangover. Still in your post Christmas hangover. Anyway, um, let's see here. I tell you what. Uh, what do we start with? What do we start with? I'm gonna be shooting a video for a song off of our upcoming record day after tomorrow thursday we'll be shooting a video and it's going to be a rocker fast rager and uh as as i may have talked about or may not have talked about i've got vog and matt over in the uk actually they're actually in uk and poland so matt's going to fly to poland to do some stuff with the video guy in vog's area and then Jared and I are going to do it here. And so, uh, yeah, it's good stuff, man. I'm excited. Getting the ball rolling. We're getting the ball rolling. Um, Let's see. What else? I've got a great clip here. You know, the fucking, this fucking war between Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine really united people against Russia, the, you know, fucking leaders of Russia, I should say, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, there's a bunch of people out there protesting in Russia, like anti-war protests galore, I mean, fucking thousands of people in St. Petersburg, Moscow, you know, very brave, courageous people out there protesting the war, they're totally not into it, they're like, fuck this shit, and, uh, so, you know, when we say that we're against, you know, unfortunately those people are paying the price because of fucking one madman. But, uh, but I tell you what, there's been some crazy protests all over and, uh, the fucking spirit of the Ukrainian people, Ukrainian people is formidable. I mean, I just, you know. To watch these fucking cowardly ass Republican fucking politicians just crumble at Trump because he fucking sent out some mean tweets when these motherfuckers over and the mayor of fucking Kiev is fucking walking around comforting people saying that we're going to fight to the fucking death. You know, it puts a lot of shit in perspective. And uh, I tell you what, though, I just found this. Uh, i got to give a shout out to Death Metal Viking on Twitter. He shared this post 
I'm going to figure out how can I share this? How do I do this? Share screen. Yeah. Share screen. Let me put my glasses on here. Yeah. Share this. This thing right here. Yeah. I'm going to share this. This is one of the best protests I've seen. This, let me set this up. This is, uh, this is happening in Paris, France right now in front of the Eiffel Tower. This is topless protesting in front of the Eiffel Tower right now. Yeah, right here. Check this out. Topless protesting right now in fucking France. I'm telling you, this is the way to protest. This got my attention. Topless protesting going on right now. I can, I, you know what? I can get, I can get down with that kind of protesting. I've never seen, I've never seen that kind of protesting before. I've never seen that. So shout out to uh, Death Metal Viking for sharing that. That was pretty cool. He's a Twitter guy. I follow him on Twitter. He's pretty, he's kind of a character. I think he's a metal head. He's got a name like Death Metal Viking. He just, he never really posts about music, so I could just be an ironic name. But, uh, yeah, that's all what's going on over there. Uh, well, let's see. What else? What else is happening? Uh, yeah, not much. You know what? This is a long podcast. I'm going to get right into the music here. This is a long one. Two and a half hours with Patrick. We go all over the place, man. It's a fucking great conversation. Funny and deep and heavy and sad at times and and then more funny so uh but right now i'm gonna play i got a couple of their songs on their new record here i wanted to tell i wanted to play you this breakdown in this new song called far from heaven this shit's a fucking right here cool song New fit for an autopsy, Oh What the Future Holds. And the title track is fucking sick. It's awesome. Now, I'm going to take this break down here. Is it this one? There it is right there. Coming up here. This fucking breakdown. This shit's so sick. Ooh, god damn it, motherfucker. Fucking dare you not to bang to that shit. Fucking sick, bro. Hashtag sick, bro. Fucking crushing, dude. That's a song called Far From Heaven. This is In Shadows. This is this riff. Woo. They're not fucking around. Fucking. This is the face I gotta make to that riff. Jesus. So why so heavy? Why so heavy? This is Oh What the Future Holds. This is the title track. I'm gonna skip past this intro because it's pretty long. But very cool. Listen to that. Super good. Stop 
There it is. Fucking crushing, right? Crushing, homies. They got the fucking scalp. They do the Gojira scalp, and then they get they do the scalp down, and then they do it up. It goes, <laughs> I heard that at one song. I don't know what song it is, but it goes, I was like, damn. There it is. There's one of them. Which is really the morbid angel scalp, just so it's said. Just so we're all clear, morbid angel was doing that shit back in the day. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, right now, the mighty, mighty Patrick Sheridan, fit for an autopsy. Boom. Patrick Sheridan. It's good to be here, bud. What's going on, Rob? What's happening? What's that? What, is it, what do you got in your hands there? Little. Uh, I made myself a little cortado. Before we got started, Cortado, what's that? It's just like a, a espresso drink. It's ah. just my coffee addiction. I have an espresso machine in my house, and I try to pretend that I'm fancy nice. and learn how to make all these drinks. What's, so, a, what's a Cortado? It's just um, a shot of espresso and then like a small amount of milk. So it's it's more espresso than milk. Okay. And gotcha. it's, it's a little bit more, I guess, fluffy, like more... Um, like more air in it than your average latte. Okay. At least that's the way I was taught to make it. So yeah, I think latte is good. mostly milk. Macchiato mm -hmm. is like half milk, and so this must be the the yeah, lead cortado is like it's like a little baby of milk in there. You know what I mean? <laughs> <Right>. So <laughs> and it's all warm. You're all rolling it back and forth between your hands. It's, it's delicious. <laughs> I was going to say the first time that we that we had that I had you on here, we were still it was like pre Zoom days, you know, like it was yeah. before the pandemic. And so nobody even knew what the fuck Zoom was. And, you know, we did it. I think we did it over the phone. And we did. It's yeah. different. Yeah. So you're, this, you're, this is way better. You're you know, you're way ahead in technology now. Yeah. I mean, it, in kind of in some ways, it kind of made the podcast, you know, mm -hmm. like if I it, like if the pandemic wouldn't have struck. I'd probably still be doing it on the phone and like driving out to San Francisco to sit down in some dude's dressing room for a half an hour while some other band fucking sound checked. And, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, I, my wife is actually the reason I'm, I've been banished to the living room is because my wife is in the studio area. We okay. share it. So she uses it for work and then I use it for my storing a million guitars and like playing music and doing that whole thing. So Normally I'd be in there, but um, she's in there on a Zoom meeting for work right now. She just works wow. from home forever. Okay. Right. So it's just, it's kind of funny how you say that because I think businesses are realizing that they could save a lot of money by having people be home. And there's been all these studies done saying that productivity is either as good or better from home. And I mean, all these corporations that are already making bajillions of dollars are now making more because they've realized they can keep you home. Right. You can work like, in your why, underwear. Why pay, why pay for office space? <laughs> right. Yeah. When when we they could just have you work in your pajamas. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I gotta say for me, uh, you know, I'm pretty fortunate that I've got a studio here in Oakland, and so it's about a yeah. 25 minute drive for me from my where I live in the eastern eastern East Bay. And uh, I don't know if I could deal like I don't know if I could deal with not with just staying at home and working and never leaving my house. That would like start to drive me crazy. Sure. I mean, I own the tattoo shop. So like the drive from home to work is like preparing. And right. then the drive from work to home is unwinding yeah. and, and letting it all kind of do the thing. And I mean, I drive my wife crazy as it is. If I was with her 24 seven, she would just murder me in my sleep, you know? <laughs> so it's, you know, I'm a handful. So it's, it's pretty good to be able to get out of the house and, and do yeah. that whole thing. But some people love it. She loves it. She loves not having to like face to face too much. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I hear you. I think for uh, for introverted people, it's like the best thing ever. I, I was just talking yeah. to the guy from Nuclear Blast, this guy Rob K, and uh, he was just like, "Oh my god, I love it! <laughs> like I <laughs> love it. I don't got it." Yeah, but you know what's crazy? People. I went to the Nuclear Blast office in L.A. on this last tour to pick up vinyl and. Uh -huh. There were three people in the building. It was a right. ghost town. 
Yeah. It was, I walked in and he was like, I wish there was more for me to show you, but like the office is empty. So yeah. there's like this whole weird thing that happens. You know what I mean? Your Starbucks will always have 400 people there, but right. you know, office buildings are now like ghost towns. Yeah. So it's if they like have a warehouse in it, the mail that's the only thing that's yeah, running. The mail supply people. That's it. <laughs> that's it. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I was. I've been talking with them because we're getting the setup going, and I was just like, "Fuck that!" Like everybody's still, you know, two years later, everybody's still working from home, which I think is crazy. You know, like I think that at least, you know, there's some, there is some, uh, you know, in an environment like that, there is some kind of like talking to each other and running into each other. You know, like, I mean, the face to face thing, as far as like social construct of things, you know what I mean? Like people seeing each other and interacting on like a human level face to face, like that's going to have some kind of an effect long term on society when people are doing everything from home and like not seeing each other and dealing with each other. Like there's some, something's going to, I can't say what, I'm not a psychologist or I don't understand any of that stuff, but I, I can tell you that it's going to have an effect and I'm just, I don't know if we'll be alive long enough to see what the effect is, but it certainly will have some effect. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause if it's like this and, 25 years there's going to be 25 year olds that have never experienced the way things used to be so right. things will just certainly change you know yeah yeah totally yeah it's a it's a it's a crazy time i gotta say congratulations on your uh tour touring i mean touring at the height of fucking omicron in the united states <laughs> playing like little 300 400 500 cap rooms and fucking success no COVID, yeah, it no was, cancellations, like fucking good. We had one. Okay. One. The one night you decided to come see us play. Oh, right. We right. had a, <laughs> <laughs> it's like right. it's like, hey, but Rob you Flynn's gonna you come moved, see you moved you moved the show. It still went on. There's no there's no quitting, dude. There's no quitting. You can't quit when you know so we were supposed to play in Petaluma and the whole city like shut down. Yeah. Like I think like the whole county shut yes. down. So, and it was like the only county in the whole country that shut down at that right. point. So we ended up moving from there to Berkeley and the show was just, it was poorly planned and there wasn't enough talk about it from the promoters side of things. And we did the best we could. And there was a couple of hundred kids there by the end of the night. And I think 175 or 180 kids, it was literally the lightest night of the whole tour. You decided to come out and I was like, fuck right. man. Like, <laughs> Was, when when I heard you were hoping playing to give in Petaluma, a, I was all Petaluma. Good show, you, like, you know. I was like, "What the fuck are they doing playing in Petaluma?" You and me both, dude. Like nothing wrong with Petaluma. You know when your booking I, agents trying to make money. Boy. I love Petaluma, but like, <laughs> no. there's not that's there's no like you know that's not where the bands play. You know, like, fucking... yeah, there's no metal scene there. I mean, they're trying, so yeah. good for them for trying. You know, but. Whatever. So they moved it to Berkeley. And while I enjoyed being in and Berkeley, no motherfuckers from Petaluma, there, nobody from say, Petaluma is going to drive to Berkeley. <laughs> like, no, not even a chance. So, yeah. like, whatever. The show was a little light. I, I had fun. It was good. We did really well. And yeah. believe it or not, the merch numbers were great. Like, everything was great. But, like, it, it was a very, it was the lightest show on the whole tour. So, other than that one day, that was the worst we had. And we did have a couple of guys get, like, sick, but. They were like, oh, I feel a little shitty. I'm going to go to bed. They took a test, nothing. Woke up the next day feeling great. And I was like, okay, we're good. Right. We're cool. We're good to go. So that's the thing. Like the facts are is that this is where we're at currently right now. And Omicron is super contagious and people get it. But luckily it's a very small effect in comparison to the way we were before. So we were just like, you know what? Let's go out. If somebody gets sick, we'll deal with it then. Be careful, be smart, wash your hands a million times, use hand sanitizer, wear face masks when you should be, don't bring anybody into the green room that you don't trust that's at least been vaccinated and is smart to take care of themselves. I mean, you and my buddy Josh and his girl were in the green room the one day, and I think that's the most people we had was three people back there ever. Yeah. So you just you gotta play it safe, but I mean, it's here, it's not going anywhere, and get vaccinated, be smart, wear your mask, wash your hands. Don't trust everybody. It, you know, if everybody from your record label wants to come hang out, like just say no, you know, like, Hey guys, we want to, we want to get through this tour and then we'll talk later, you know, but we got lucky, man. We played every single date that was scheduled. And 
16 sold out shows, um, like crazy numbers for us, like 700 kids in North Carolina sold out in Atlanta, almost over 600 kids at the Gramercy in New York, which I'm surprised we didn't sell out, but New York was still real tight back then when, you know, at that point, it was still Omicron was still a thing. So to do 600 kids in New York city at that point in time was really crazy. Um, like 400 kids in Iowa city on a Tuesday, like those numbers. That's fucking never. Yeah. Yeah. For us, that's never happened. So we're very, very lucky, man. We really are like across the board. The tour was incredible. Um, and and I, I can't say enough, like people were great. There was not one fight. There was not one weird situation. I mean, it was hands down the best tour the band's ever done. And all of the bands supporting on that tour said the same thing, like best tour we've ever done. Tell Easy it. in and out. It, it was great. Yeah. It was really, really great. So yeah. Thank you for coming out again. That was, it was a fun day. So. It was fun. It was a good, it was a good hang. Yeah. It was a really good hang. Got some tacos, got to check out some good metal. I got turned down to some new Possibly bands. The best tacos I've ever had. Oh my God. For, for sure. Could possibly be the best. Tacos good, right? <laughs> that place yeah, is, that place is crazy. Day. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to a Cancun Taqueria in Berkeley. For real. <laughs> if, where, if, and if you're playing the Cornerstone in Berkeley, it's right three blocks away. So you got to hit it, it up. Yeah. Don't fuck that one up. Definitely go to that place. <laughs> yeah. Or get after show if you can. No, that's for, that's a big accomplishment though, man. And I got to say, I was very, I was very uh, stoked for you guys. Cause I was just like, fuck yeah, man, it's a crazy mean, time to be torn. And, like everything was going crazy and, you know, hundred thousand people a month dying. We were, <laughs> was, we were just over it, right? Yeah, and you dropped a new. I was record, just like, so you, you know what? Like, we're either. It, well, that's the thing. We like think about it. Like when Sea of Tragic Beast dropped, that was I think October, and then by January, everything was shut down. Right. So we did two tours on that. We did a headliner in the states, and then we went to Europe with Iron Is Murder, then we came back and we did. did one show on the support tour that we were supposed to do with thy art. We played one show in Philadelphia at the TLA and it was like grand opening, grand closing. Yeah. Like first and last day of tour all right grand there. Opening. You know what I mean? Is that the kiss, the Chris rocks get <laughs> grand opening, grand yeah. closing, <laughs> grand closing. Yeah, that was it. You know, I can't, I, I can't even explain what that felt like. Like trailer with like fifteen thousand dollars worth of merch in it uh, we got a sound guy uh, uh, we rented a board we rented a snake we rented travel everything everything right like, i know so we're much like money. 35 so... i ever yeah easily 40 grand in debt at the beginning of that tour and the only thing that saved us was putting our merch up and everybody went crazy so we had see a tragic beast that essentially is still a new record for us because we've never really toured on any of the songs yeah. and then Oh, what the future holds. So we have these two records. We get ready for the tour and Omicron hit. And they were like, I don't know. What do we do? And I was like, we go on tour. We're going. Like, if it gets canceled, at least we tried. But I'm not doing this again. Like, let's just pack the trailer and get the fuck on the road. And it worked, man. It worked. Everybody was great. So we got lucky. Yeah, that's rad. Yeah, I, yeah, cause, yeah. That we talked about that the last time, though. You know, it is good to just kind of go over it. Like the pandemic hit on day two of the tour, and everything shut down. And my artist Murder had all their, you know, they're already over from yeah. Australia. That fucking printed up so all so much money. Yes, yeah, so much. So money. screwed. You know, people. There was a the- band from. There's a band from Iceland on that tour. <laughs> they came from like people don't get it. I mean. Yeah. That, that's something that we could talk about. Like people complain about like ticket prices sometimes and stuff. While I very much understand people don't realize how much money you spend even before you get in the van bus or wagon and get on the road. Like it's, it's fucking scary sometimes to think that, well, what happens if something stops that tour? Yeah. Now we all know, we all know how many bands can't tour anymore. Right. It's, yeah. it's crazy. It's crazy. Oh, I mean, so, oh, dude, like, I mean, like people don't understand that, like you probably don't even make your money back on a tour until two thirds of the way through a tour because it costs so much just to get on the road. Yeah. So much Everybody's to, like, get, oh, that- just to get to the first day costs, you know, fucking crazy money. 
Yeah, it's pretty insane, especially if you have production. And, you know, this is our first tour where we had like real production and like yeah. the light guy. Looks killer. Like, when I, thank you. When I saw the receipt from, from the light company, I was like, what the fuck is right. this? <laughs> you know what I mean? We're like, so, I didn't, we didn't even have that much. This isn't Ramstein. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty nuts, dude. It is. So, yeah, but uh, whatever. I mean, we make it work and, COVID, and that's another thing I want to say. This is like the first opportunity I've had to say this publicly. Like to everyone that is going out and supporting bands right now and risking, you know, everything that they're risking, like, thank you. Like, thank you for supporting heavy music. Thank you for supporting us and all of the bands on our tour. Like, I was discussing with the other bands how they were doing, like, merch wise, because I just wanted to make sure that the tour was worth it for them to be on. And the, what they were saying to me, like, just made me realize that heavy metal has a really loyal and amazing fan base. So thank you for coming out. Like, obviously like we went and did it, but if it wasn't for people being there, it it wouldn't matter. So to everybody that's doing that and supporting music right now, like you guys are the most important thing for us to be able to continue doing what we do. And and we appreciate it. Yeah. That's awesome. Well said, man. Well said. Especially because you know, <sighs> after just finishing everything and you're kind of like, I'm sure just fucking relieved. <laughs> you know, like you know. The last day of the last show, uh, when, when I was loading, I, I remember putting my cases back on the rig. Tim looked at me and I looked at him and I went, I fucking can't believe we did it. <laughs> and he started laughing and like, but it's true. Like you're holding your breath through the whole tour, just waiting for it, you know? So we got lucky. <laughs> How did uh, how did Tim make out on the rest of his Tinder uh, role? <laughs> I don't even want to talk about it, dude. I'm not gonna. I'm a, not gonna. No comment. Role. No comment. <laughs> no comment, dude. You're gonna get that boy in trouble. <laughs> Tim's Tim's a magnificent human being. I love Tim. He's great, right. and that's as much as I'll comment on that. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. okay. Pleading the fifth. <laughs> that was pretty funny, though. Hanging backstage. Hearing yeah, he's that, hearing how you, you know, single men do on the road. <laughs> that must be a nice life, you know. <laughs> totally, I'm pretty man. happy never having to deal with that, to be completely honest. I like I like being married. <laughs> it keeps me out of trouble. Yeah, I've only seen my road crew use Tinder, so that's the only reason I know how to use Tinder. <laughs> you know, like, oh like, God, so I'm like, what are you doing? Like, okay, swipe left, swipe right, gotcha. Well, well that, that goes back to what we were just talking about, about the whole social aspect and face-to-face meeting, like, People are meeting boyfriends and girlfriends and husbands and wives on on Tinder. You're yeah. not going to the bar. You're not meeting at a metal show. You're meeting on Tinder. It's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, I'm, totally. I, I'm old. That's what it comes down to. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah it's I never pretty met, funny. I've never met any. I mean, I've met a few people. I mean, probably now I've made friends from like online. Sure. Know? I mean, like where you were, you know, whether it be, um you know like back in the day it would have been like message boards or you know i'm not really a facebook dude but you know through instagram or whatever and then you like mm-hmm. you feel like you, you get to know somebody through kind of voyeuring into their life and then you meet them in re- real life and you're like oh yeah but like yeah. you already kind of know them yeah it's weird that people like know my kid my kids names and my, my, my kids name and my wife's name and my dog's names right. before i ever actually meet them in yeah, person that's it's the weirdest uh, that I got to say, and you can probably relate to this too, you know, cause like you're, you know, s- semi-famous and when you're like semi-famous, like people come up to you and like, I just you, like, I'm just going about my day. Like I don't even, I don't ever expect to talk to anybody. I don't ever expect to be recognized. I realize that sure. once I go outside, I will likely be recognized and I just like whatever. But you know, sometimes people come up to me and you know, you meet so many fucking people. And like someone will come up, Rob, how's it going? But how's it going with the house or the dog or the kids? Or, you know, like, and they'll start having a conversation like you've talked before, like you've had. You never have. Some, and you, and then I'm just like, <laughs> and then I'm like sitting there, and I start to feel bad, like, oh my god, I don't remember this person at all. Like, who the fuck is this? And then I'll be like, have we met before? And they'll be like, no. And I'm like, ah. Oh, oh, internet. <laughs> internet yeah i yeah. beat myself up going like oh i fucking uh, i should remember this person it sounds like <laughs> yeah it's it's but you know like everybody complains about it but also the platform that it gives us to get our music out there the way that we do is incredible 
You know yeah, what I mean? Like totally. hundreds of thousands of people following you on the internet that may never get to see your band because they're right. somewhere far or place you'll never go or whatever, like whatever the you know case may be. It's just incredible that they get to listen to what we do. So that's, there's yin and yang, you know yeah. what I mean? It's, Oh yeah. For, I, de- I mean, I definitely see the benefits of the internet, you know I mean? Like, you know, I'm old, you know, like I'm, I'm older than I'm a dinosaur compared to a young man like you. So well, how uh, old are you? I'm 54. Oh man. You're not that much older than me, dude. Less than 10 <laughs> years, man. You make me, I mean, I've been listening to your band since high school. So I guess that says something, but you know, you, know, you think like uh, the way that the only way that you used to be able to communicate with your fans before was through a magazine and, and it was magazines. always through the lens of a magazine. So if that magazine yeah. liked you, then like, you know, you were portrayed in a good light. If that magazine didn't like you, they would fucking shit on you and make you look like a dickhead, you know, yeah, they and, get so, you. and then social media came along. And even before that, like message boards and shit like that. And we jumped right on that. We were like, fuck it. Like, oh, yeah. this is a direct communication. And, uh, you know, I think that I, I feel like it, it really did just open up a whole new way for, for bands to communicate with their fans, which I've always loved. I kind of feel yeah, like, it's, I kind of feel like it's in some ways, I kind of feel like it's past it's peaked. Like it's not, it's like reached this disconnect. I don't know. I said this the other day and uh, I don't want to repeat myself, but uh, I had um, Andy black from the black veil brides on here. Andy Beerson. Mm-hmm. And super, super nice guy. I fucking big fan of their record, Wretched and Divine. And uh, I mean, this is like the closest I've had to a pop star on my band. Like this dude has like sure. two, mil- two million Instagram followers. You know, it's fucking crazy. Insane. It's insane. insane fucking numbers. And like he puts up a post of just him, you know, sitting on a fucking chair and it's like, you know, 300,000 likes. <laughs> you know, like it's crazy. You know, 12,000 yeah. comments and you're like, what the fuck? This motherfucker is just sitting on a chair. But, you know. But, but, you know, and we were talking about this a little bit too, how, you know, there is this super dedicated fan base that wants to see him on Instagram, but won't necessarily like run out and listen to the new album or buy the new album or stream the new album or watch the new video. And like how, you know, there is a disconnect in some ways when it comes to that nowadays. I don't know if it's a disconnect. I think. Yeah, maybe that's not the right think, word, but you know. I think they've connected to the part of that band that they're capable of connecting to. Because like, you'll hear a song or or see a band play live and be like, oh, they're cool, whatever. And then you'll see an interview with one of the guys or girls or whatever from the band. And all of a sudden you're like, I like this person. I, I want to know about this person. And then you go in and you're like, man, I can actually be exposed to this person on a somewhat semi-personal level by following their social media or, or doing whatever. So maybe, maybe disconnect is to me seems like negative. And and that is the negative part is that they all be a hundred thousand people paying attention to us, but maybe half of that will actually listen to our bands. Right. But then also think about how you can connect individually with a person and not even like what they create. I think that that's more genuine than going out and seeing a band and being like, oh, I don't really like the band, but the dude's cool. He's got a good message. Like, I kind of, I kind of like that. You know what I mean? So, I, I understand what you're saying about like how they might not pick up the record, but how much more genuine is it to just be like, oh, I just like, I like Rob. Rob's cool, so I follow him on the internet. And if Rob does something, I'll pick it up or whatever. But I, I'm not a huge fan of the band. I think that's like kind of more real, you know, than a bunch of posers wearing shirts of bands that they can't name one song but they think right. the chick is hot or they, they think the dude is hot or yeah. they, you like, know whatever it is you know it's like, like it all, just the, seems Ramon, more all the ramones shirts out there <laughs> right it's like buying a cbgb shirt from fucking hot topic or something like the, the club has been closed down for how long now you know what i mean it's like right. you've never been to cbs but oh well i like the shirt okay right, whatever, right. you know or like yeah. what it, it means or whatever yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's interesting. interesting. It's an interesting time, and it's hard to like. I don't know. I think it's hard to uh, disseminate all of that information. You know, I mean, obviously yeah. the tour is their fucking tour that they're out doing, getting ready to do is killing it. So you they're know, gonna working kill it. there, yeah. they're doing ridiculous numbers in merch. Like, you know, so like where it all, you know, it's almost like you can't. Like a record is almost irrelevant in like the gauge of success of a band now. <laughs> in some it's way. crazy. It's <laughs> it's crazy to think about. Like our our record did really really well, 
but like, I don't even know how much that matters anymore. You know, we used to, that was the thing we were always worried about our whole career. And now it's like, Oh, how many views did that live shot from New York get? You know what I mean? <laughs> right. It's like, fuck the record. It's like, let's right. see, you know, and, and that's a big problem with endorsements too now. Right. Um, like I started recently working um, with guitar Marine pickups as an A&R guy. And so I'll get emails from people and it'll just be like, Oh, I have this many views on Instagram and this like that. And then I'm like, okay, cool. Like, how many records have you put out? What's your touring schedule like? Like, no one cares about that anymore. It's all baseline internet. And, and it's just like, man, this is crazy to think that this is how things work. Could you, could you imagine going to a company 25 years ago and be like, there's going to be this thing called the internet and I'm going to be huge on it. So you got to give me free guitars. They'd be like, yeah, get the hell out of here, dude. Like, I haven't yeah. sold any records, but I've got a million followers. Like what? <laughs> what is that? And now that's just kind of like commonplace, but the opposite. You know, everything... care how many records you've sold. We want to know what your Instagram yeah. are, or your TikTok. Instagram is like passe. It's like your TikTok followers now. Yeah. It's pretty crazy, man. I just, I just navigate through it because like it's part of the job. I don't, I don't use TikTok. I don't, I don't know crap about that. I get Instagram. I'll put my posts, my stories up and do that whole thing. And then the band does their stuff. And it's, I, I'd probably be doing way better if I understood how TikTok worked, but I just don't. So oh, yeah, I like TikTok. Point, <laughs> I, you know what? I, I like watching TikTok. I'm not like a big creator on TikTok. Like, hey, like it's same. a lot of fucking work. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it seems, it seems painstaking. It you seems like I mean? a lot of work that I don't have any time to do. <laughs> like, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I can post a nuts. picture of me and Patrick hanging out at the show, but like, I'm not going <laughs> to edit a whole fucking video together and add sub shit. Like, yeah, us know. walking down the street, getting tacos, go back to the show, <laughs> that's it. live clip. No, that yeah, seems that's like it. way too much. Like, these people are making yeah. like mini movies half the time. I'm like, fucking crazy. It's insane. I mean, good for Co The Cohen brothers are making my TikToks now. That's how that's working. So, right, right. insanity, dude. <laughs> I mean, it's we're crazy. talking about like, we're going to do like a, we're going to do like a TikTok only video, you know, okay. like, like shot in, you know, whatever, uh, not ver yeah, vertical shot in vertical, like on a phone and then, you know, and do like whatever, like good lighting and, you know, make it look cool. But like, you know, just to do it because it's like, there's so much, you know, traffic over there and, you know, taking yeah. a regular video and then cropping it to like that always looks like shit anyway. Yeah. So, yep. But just I don't know. I don't know enough music video. That. Yeah, you know what you should do? Hit up Tim because that dude knows everything about the internet. Oh, it's yeah. insane. Yeah, he he knows all things social media. I've never seen it, but he'll talk to me and I'll be like, you know what? You can do this. I'm going over there. I'm like, yeah. I have no time. So yeah, yeah but whatever. I mean, just I what happens say, when you get old. Have you found that as you've uh you know, and maybe it's maybe it's getting old, or maybe it's like just the fact that like you are you know, I think when you're, you know, in the public eye, I think mm -hmm. the lens that you view social media starts to change over time. Sure. You know, like you, you, you know, you're not super active on social media, but I'm sure you see, you know, you and I have talked about some people who are just like, oh my God, 20 times a fucking day on social media, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. We're not like, gonna how do you have the time? We won't name any names or whatever, but it's just like, it's too much. Like, it's just fucking overkill. And, yeah. you know, you already put yourself, I mean, you already put yourself out there a lot as a human being, whether it be from albums and interviews and social media and whatever. And it's like, at some point, is it just like, this is just too, like too much. Like I'm just, it's, there's no, it, I think it's okay. The only thing I can compare it to is like, you go see a band play live and they backing track everything. Right. Right. So then, the next band goes on and they're super tight, but no matter how tight you are, you're never going to sound like the band that's kind of using all the tracks off the CDs to play live. So then another band tours with that band and then they have to do that. And then they have to do it. And the next band has to do it in order to compete and, and get the crowd into it. So then you create this false sense of what a live show is. Right. So that's what happens with music. Like we, we use minimal, minimal tracks. It's like third guitar parts, fourth guitar parts, piano, you know, bass drops, just the simple stuff. But there are bands out there really running tracks, just 
I know this sounds weird, like a weird comparison, but I think it works for me. So you create this false sense of reality on what a live show is. And then when you go see a sick band that doesn't use tracks, people just don't think it's good, right? Remember, you used to be able to like, if the crowd is responding to something, you play it three more times just to kind of, you know, extend the breakdown or, or keep playing right, that right. part. That's over now. You can't do that anymore yeah. because you have to play to a click. You have to sound like the record. You have to do things a certain way. That's what social media does with relationships with people and people's expectations. When you have a group of people that are constantly putting out content, the content constantly creating a thing, fans of the music or fans of whatever believe that that's what everybody is supposed to be doing. So then when you have somebody that maybe is a little more introverted or isn't great at the social media thing or doesn't have, they can actually fall behind no matter how talented they are or how good they are. You create that false sense of what is expected of an artist the same way they create a false sense of what is expected of a live show or what is expected of the way that you publicly put yourself out there. And some people just aren't good at that. Some people can't talk the way that you and I talk and there's nothing wrong with that. Like my drummer, he's a little introverted. He's not great at people. He's, I mean, you were in the room, the dude said five words the whole time. It's just his personality. So I think people have this false expectation of what you're supposed to do because of those people that are running at a million miles an hour with it. So I'm never going to be a guy that does three uh, story posts and five uh, uh, posts in a day on Instagram and then goes on to, I just, I, I have a kid and a wife and business to run and right. a band to run. And, you know, I got four or five dogs and I, I my life is insane. So <laughs> when, <laughs> when I'm giving somebody a little something of myself and they just keep wanting more, it makes me hate the internet. Yeah. It, it, it just makes me hate it. So I know that's a really long winded way to explain it, but that's kind of how I try to, I try to like put things into perspective with why it's like that. And it's literally the expectation of the person looking at it. And that's unreasonable to me. So I'm never going to give them everything that they want. I just can't. It's just not there. I, uh, I, so last year around April, my mom passed away and, you know, I was sorry. depressed and you know, this, this has got nothing. This is still to do with social media. So I don't want to just go mm -hmm. into that, but, um, mm -hmm. but you know, I really, at that, at that time, you know, maybe prior to that, I had been posting quite a bit on social media, just because everybody else was. But, uh, you know, it kind of just made me step back. Like, I didn't want to, like, I can't fucking stand people who fucking, you know, it's like, what do they call it? Facebook fishing. Like, oh, God, I feel so bad today. Oh, why do you feel so bad today? You know, they just put out this little cryptic fucking like, oh, God. Yeah something happened oh what happened man oh i don't want to talk about it you know like it's all, it's so like fucking manipulative and set up and like fucking annoying like and i know i got a bunch of people i know who do it and it drives me fucking crazy like oh god and then you just get this like you know instagram sympathy or facebook and i'm like i'm not that fucking i don't fucking want your sympathy like i just checked out like i just checked off of yeah. instagram like i just you know i don't need to go oh my god like fucking everybody i was just like hey like i'm it's just I'm gonna work this out on my own. I'm gonna figure this out on my own, and fucking I don't need to do this in public, and and uh, or, or certainly not on social media. And you know, it kind of stuck. Like it kind of stuck with me. Like I just, it was a long enough break that I was like, "Fuck, this is kind of nice." And, you know, every time I go on like Twitter or whatever, I just get mad. <laughs> like I go on Instagram and I just get fucking mad. I'm like, "Fuck, fuck you," or "Fuck this person," or "Fuck this place," or. Yep. And, uh, and so I've kind of stayed off and, you know, as a, as a result of that, interestingly, my numbers, my, my follower numbers, this must have something to do with the algorithm have literally plummeted. You know, at one point I mm -hmm. had like, I had like 300,000 followers at one point. Now I'm down to like 160. So like almost half because <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Because, and I'm like, First of all, no one's unfollowing me because I didn't post something, you know? Right. Like, this is right. a Instagram, Facebook level. This is just like, oh, look, oh, your, your followers are going down. You better get your followers back up, you know? like, mm -hmm. And I didn't even notice it until like fucking months later because I was just like, and then I was like, fuck it, fuck you, Instagram. I was like, yeah. no one's going to ever, I, I have never unfollowed somebody because they didn't post. 
I unfollowed somebody because I saw a post they put up. I'm like, fuck this jackass. Like, I'm unfollowing this motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah. It's so goofy, dude. It's just goofy. It's weird. It's it's a whole weird thing. It's like, am, I'm not going to be pushed into a corner by a thing that I hold in my hand. Right. You know what I mean? Like, just, I can crush that thing and keep it moving. You know what I mean? If, and the facts are, it's like, if I disappeared off of social media forever, who's going to really care that much, dude? Who's going to, who's going to really care? Nobody's going to really care. You know, I, I don't know. It's weird. It's weird where we're at as musicians and, and where we're at as business people and the way that things work, but it's always something, you know? Oh, you know, well, I'm, te- I'm telling you, if you're get, if you get your attendance numbers up over this, then you'll get the bigger tours. Okay, cool. Oh, well now you got to get your Instagram numbers. Oh, well now it's TikTok. So you're TikTok. Right, it's right. always something, you know, it's yeah. always some like, we're, we're totally going to give you a hand job, but only until yeah. you do all these things that we say, and it changes every time, right. you know? So it's always something, man. And it's fine. It's, yeah. it's the career path I've chosen. It used to be, you know what it used to be? It used to be like, you got to get a certain number of sound scans. Like I remember on Through the yep. Ashes of Empires, Revolver Magazine, who had fucking literally blacklisted us, like refused to give us an interview, refused to review any records, like just cut off all contact with their old editor and all this stuff. And then right. uh, finally they got back and they said, look, if you sell 30,000 records, sound scan 30,000 records, we'll, we'll do an article on you. So we hit 30,000. Okay, well, if you hit 50,000, then we'll do an article with you. Okay, we've hit 50,000. If you hit 75,000, we'll, then we'll do the article with you guys. And then we hit 75,000. Well, the record's been out too long, so now we can't do an article on you. Of course. I mean, it was like that kind of shit. And now it's like, you know, now it's a new, whatever the new barometer is is yeah it's all bullshit despite the fact that we were headlining fucking drawing killer numbers you know selling crazy merch you know obviously so you know who wouldn't be fucking stoked with seventy five thousand records now you know what i mean like you sell 75 records seventy five thousand records now you're gonna buy your own jet that's crazy (laughs) right people don't even you know uh i think we did somewhere in like the like six thousand ish first week and we were like blown away you know what i mean like we couldn't believe that we did that many right you know but it's like those kinds of numbers, 75,000 records, that, that is very rare nowadays. You, you know, when you check like first week numbers, there's maybe like four bands doing numbers like that. They're always the biggest bands in the world, like right. fucking Foo Fighters or whatever. Right. You know what I mean? Totally, yeah. Yeah. So you, bands like us, we don't do that anymore. Yeah, I mean, what did Iron, Ma- Iron Maiden did 60,000 their first week. <laughs> yeah, and, and they might, a couple of people might like that band. You know what I mean? Like they might be a big (laughs) band or, or one of the biggest bands in the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was, it's fucking wild. It's wild being a musician at times. Like sometimes I I talk to my friends every once in a while, like every six months I have like a fucking meltdown where I'm like, fuck, I'm fucking quitting this shit. Fuck this fucking shit. (laughs) shit. There's a million reasons to do it and, and 10 million reasons not to do it. <laughs> totally, totally. You know? Right. Yeah. There's so many more reasons to not do it, but you just fucking, you know, at this point, I've just been doing it for so long. This is, this is what I do, you know? And I guess, and I guess, and I guess this is all I want to be known for, you know? Like, I don't sure. want to be known, like, I, that's what, that's, that's one of the conclusions I came to out of this post, uh, you know, my mom dying and like getting off of fucking social media. Like, I don't want to be known for my fucking Instagram. Like, I don't want to be known for my fucking, like, I don't, I don't even want to be known for my podcast. I just want to be known sure. for my fucking music. That's it. You know, Absolutely. my politics, not my fucking bullshit. Like just my fucking songs. I do my best to just like, let our music speak for itself, politics and like where I'm at with the world and stuff like that. And kind of like, I occasionally get fed up enough where I have to put a post up once in a while and be like, <laughs> like, fuck everybody. You're all fucking <laughs> right. stupid or whatever. But like, I, I try to keep politics you seem smarter minimal. Than that. It's not that dumbed down. No, you usually have, no, you've always it's, got something, it's not, you know, but, but it takes me like two hours to make the post because <laughs> <laughs> where it starts is like, it starts by me typing like, fuck all you. And then I'm like, no, I can't say that. And like, and then I'm like, that's going to get me in trouble. And then, Finally, it comes out halfway intelligent sometimes. And like, I try to keep that at, at as minimal as I can with where we're at politically. Because if you know anything about the band or anything about what we do, you kind of get it where we stand. 
So if you want to have a face-to-face conversation with me, then fine. But I'm not going to get baited into some fucking dick measuring contest with somebody on the internet over something that somebody could potentially skew as the wrong thing. Right. And then boom, now I'm this thing, you know, right. I've done enough things in my life, stupid. And now I'm trying to be smart and, and not put myself in those situations and get roped into that. But it's, it's hard. It's really hard sometimes because there are a lot of people with platforms that are just, they just shouldn't have platforms, you know? So to have that mentality and to like, keep your brain in that spot, like, this is not what I should be known for. And this is what I want people to know about me. Like that's probably the smartest thing as you know, somebody who's in our world is to just don't say dumb shit on the internet. Don't say, don't say things that can get you in trouble, but don't also don't hide who you are. If you're a shitty person, I want to know that. (laughs) So like, that's fine. But just don't, don't get baited. There's so many people on social media. Nobody says they're a shitty person it's like right we, but, it's like we only share our best looking selfie our most exciting moment our here's me on vacation here i'm eating this you know like it's yeah like we only show the best shit and it is so misleading it's very very misleading yeah you know super misleading i mean dude listen no, nobody's living a hallmark life if, if your posts are always you know bright and sunny and all this stuff like you're you're full of shit and that's why like I put pictures of my guitars and pictures of cars and pictures of my dogs and my kid and my wife. Cause those are things that actually make me happy. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't give a shit about going to Maui or like, you know, being on a beach or how much money somebody has or whatever. I just post the things that I like and, and in the hopes that I can like drum up other people on my page to have conversations and learn about those things and teach about those things and, and, and like have like a real, community following my page like i don't i don't want to talk about bullshit so i i just think it's smarter to just be who you are and do what you like for real and don't pretend too much and but you know what i mean it's it's where we live as i'm saying it out loud i'm just like man nobody gives a shit about what i think about what they should be on the internet or what i am on the internet so And then even then when you post, like every once in a while, you post like a picture of you because you're super into BMWs, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Like so they right. post a picture of my car and somebody's like, oh, you got my like, God, it's like, right? come like, on, They dude. just fucking, I've read like a couple of them. I'm like, oh my God, just fucking stop. <laughs> like, yeah, it's childish. Like, dude, what, but you you're know not what? supposed, you're in a band. You shouldn't be able to drive. Like, why yeah. not? Why how should you be able to drive? <laughs> like, what the yeah. fuck? How dare you buy a used car? Listen. <laughs> I've said it before and I'll say it again. If I can't afford to buy a used car, I'm doing something wrong. You know, people get so mad. And and I've learned to realize that a lot of people get mad about that, say stuff about that because they haven't situated themselves in a position to be able to do the things that they love and have a career behind it and and actually be successful. And and like, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I wasn't successful up until very recently and I still have a really long way to go. And the work is nowhere near being done. And, when you become successful in order to keep that success going or get better, you have to work harder than you were working before. So when people get mad about that shit, it's like, well, you're, you're mad at me because I'm willing to sacrifice the normal things in life to be successful at the stuff that I just really want to do. And I refuse to do what everybody tells me to do. If I listen to my parents, I'd probably be working in a fucking warehouse right now. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you're going to tattoo. You're not going to make any money doing that. Well, they're wrong about that. And then, oh, you're going to play in a band. By the time you're in your mid-20s, you're not going to listen to that heavy metal bullshit anymore anyway. You should just go, you know, and we all have that in our lives. So, you know, you got to choose, like, do you want to be successful or not be successful? And are you willing to sacrifice so you can have nice things and do what you like, you know? And do you, you ask my wife, like, I struggled the first 10 years of our relationship trying to balance everything and then one day it just started working because i sacrificed so much and we worked so hard and did the tours for a hundred dollars a night and suffered through it all and did all that shit to get to where we are so if you're mad at me because i bought a car or because i i I don't know what i have a nice guitar like that's not my fucking problem like that's somebody else's problem you know what i mean so when they make those comments from now on i'm just going to screenshot them before i 
delete them and then I'm going to send them to you and we can talk about it the next <laughs> nice, time nice. on the podcast. We'll shit talk them. Yeah. We'll shit talk them behind yeah. the back. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we work we work in an industry where people like are nice to your face. And then the second you walk away, they have so many bad things to say about you. Right. And you go to Nam one time and you'll get to experience that, yeah. you know, both happen to you and then watch it happen to other people. Right. And like, I'm just not nice to people that I don't care to be around. And people take that as me being an aggressive asshole. And it's like, no, dude, like I just, I just don't have time to lie to you. You know what I mean? I would rather be, like I said, I would rather be real in face to face than act that way. And in this industry, I've had so much shit talked about me and seen so many really nice people have shit talked about them by people that are just bummed because they're not getting what they want, you know, and, and not to say that I'm getting more than everybody else. I'm just saying that I've seen some really, really shitty things said about some really nice people in this industry. And it's all because people are jealous of that person, you know? So it's such a weird, weird thing we're a part of, man. It really is because yeah. I know some really talented musicians that should be light years ahead of where I am that are stuck, not being able to do anything for some weird reason. You know what I mean? So we, we're involved in a strange, strange world, man. It's a really a strange world. I know you've experienced it a bunch. Oh my God. So yeah, totally. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, and I think that, you know, you made a really good point there about how, you know, I don't think most people realize how much you have to sacrifice just to do this. You know, this is a, there is absolutely no guarantee. There's no benefits. There's no Medicare, <laughs> you know, like we don't get medical coverage. Like not, I mean like all the shit that people like just think is like totally a standard of, of life to work. Like we don't get that, you know, like there's no, and, and in order to do this, like, there's got to be no fucking plan B. Like you have to just go it, at this fucking harder than you'll ever, ever imagine that you would. And, and you'll so, fucking barely even get to where you want to go for a long time because of it. Oh, and, even if you do have success, and even after you do have success, depending on the fucking record deal you signed, you still might not have any money <laughs> because you might've yeah. signed all your fucking shit away. You know, I mean, swindlers, man. You know, there's a lot of that out there. I mean, we've gotten really lucky with Nuclear Blast. They're great. They're like, they're the best possible scenario, you know? And, and but I mean, even aside from money, let's let's just talk about like sacrificing your body, right? Like people don't realize. I remember we did like 78 days straight. We flew. Oh my God. Yeah, no day I, I flew. Um, there were like a handful of days in between. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. But it, I couldn't go home. It was like because of the scenario. Like so two back-to-back tours or something. Th three. Really? So I flew from Atlanta where I live to LA, did Nam, and then from LA to Japan. Japan, we did two weeks or a week and a half with Dyer's Murder and bullet trained around the whole country. Yeah, yeah, it, was, yeah. it was so cool. And then we flew from there to Brisbane and then started an Australian tour. So the first day was in Perth. So we flew from Brisbane to Perth, Perth to Adelaide, Adelaide to Sydney, oh, you went Sydney, back. Melbourne. Yeah. So that's like, that's like yeah. going from New York to California. Huge, it's six hour, seven hour flight. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. But what people don't, they're like, oh, that sounds Exhausting. so cool. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, let me, let me break this down for you. So you get to the show, you load in, you sound check, you wait. You play the show, you load out, you're out by 1 a.m. You go back to a hotel, you take a shower, you sleep two, maybe three hours, right, maybe wake so. up at 5 a.m. Yep. to be back on a plane for 7 a.m. Yep. to get to the venue at 1 p.m. to load in to do it all again. And you do that for 10 days and then you don't sleep. You're in this parallel universe yeah. the <laughs> whole time because you're running on like 15 hours sleep in 10 days. Yeah, And then we had two days off in Brisbane and we check out this flight schedule. So we do all the flights in um, Australia. And then we flew from Brisbane to Sydney, Sydney to, I, I can't remember the in-between, but there was an in-between. And then from there to London Heathrow, London Heathrow to Dusseldorf, 
to yeah. jump in Probably like to India, uh, India or Greece or something like that, right? You know, some maybe Singapore. I can't remember exactly Singapore, where because yeah. it's kind of jumbled in my brain. And then we jumped in. Yeah, that's always a big. Do, that's always a big transfer point, Singapore, right? Yeah, what a crazy airport! And um, and then we jumped in to do thirty-two days with Sepultura. So it was two two-week tours, a couple days off, fly to Europe. Sepatora run, then back home. Bro, wow. I got home and slept for almost 24 straight hours. Oh, yeah. Like, came home, kissed my wife, hugged my son, ate a meal, laid down, woke up 12 hours later, went to the bathroom, ate another meal, went to bed, woke up again. <laughs> like, the saga, like, I'm losing years of my life. And when you try to explain to people, they're like, oh, that sounds incredible. And I'm like, yes, part of it's incredible. But then there's this other part of it where a piece of my soul, is now gone yeah. because I just like got run over by an airplane a hundred times. Right. You know what I mean? And it sounds funny. Like, Oh, you're complaining about this. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it takes a certain kind of person, people to be able to live that kind of lifestyle and give up that much. And it, it's not one band that has to do it. It's every band. Yeah. You don't get ahead without getting hit by that bus. You don't get ahead without throwing yourself all over the coals to like sacrifice and do this thing. So when I tell people, like, if you're not willing to put in 110%, don't because you're just going to waste four years of your life to fail. You have to go for it. I mean, we've been a band since 2007 and we have like two records out that people forget even exist. You know, they're like, Oh, well, you know, absolute hope. That's your first record. I'm like, no, bro, there's process of human extermination and hellbound before absolute hope, you know, and sometimes people don't even remember that. So it's like, there's always this like five year period for every band that just disappears because that's why you're break, you know, you're cutting your teeth in that period. And uh, it takes a lot. It, it, and, and I wouldn't trade it. It's incredible. And I tell everybody, if this is what you really want, then yeah, go for it. But like, be ready to eat peanut butter sandwiches in the back of a van for oh the next God. five, six years of your life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're not, you know, we're not making millions of dollars. We're, we're making enough money so we can go on tour and then come home to a regular job and then go out on tour again and still be able to keep the same kind of lifestyle. Yeah. You know, like be ready to not, jump on, jump into a studio apartment on wheels with 15 other dudes and live with them for seven weeks. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and be ready to do that five to six times a year and make no money yeah. For like the first five years of doing that. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah. It's and pretty come crazy. Home, come home with, you know, come home with, you know, maybe $500 or a thousand dollars in your pocket for all of that. There was a point in time when we were touring that I was making nothing and I was paying the other guys in the band. And the reason I was doing that was because I was like, all right, I'm tattooing when I get home, I can catch up and, and make enough money as a tattooer that I can, I can afford to not make real money on the road and I can pay these guys a, a little bit of a weekly salary so they can afford to live and keep doing this because I knew I had the right group of people, you yeah. know? So I would come home from tour and just pockets empty. And my wife would be like, what are you doing? Like why? And I had to explain to her, like, I'm going to lose these guys yeah. if I don't sacrifice this and just pay them. Yeah. So I did that for, probably three years until we were making enough money that I could actually afford to pay myself a little something. And now we have a, we have a sound guy and a light guy. I'm like a millionaire. You know what I mean? Right. Like, so it's just hard to explain you're paying to yourself people. and your light guy and your guys and your sound guy. Right? Yeah. It's crazy. Everybody's making yeah. money. I don't know what to do, you know? Yeah. So like, it's just, it's all about how bad you want it. You know, it's not even necessarily how talented you are. It's about writing a good song and being willing to, you know, eat scraps for a little while until yeah. it happens. And that can go on. You know, what you're talking about can go on forever. You know what I mean? Like sure. the first 20 years of Machine Head, I donated, not donated, that's not the right word, but like I took 50% of my publishing and just put it back into the band to run, you know, pay people's salaries, pay people sure. medical, you know, we've got medical and shit, you know, people are on salary, like you know, my guys and, and for everything, literally to fund the band, you know, I write 80 mm -hmm. to 85% of every record, but I took 50% of that for 20 fucking years. You know, think about how yeah. long that is of a time. 
you know, and, and it was to keep people. Like if I took all the fucking money from my songwriting for publishing, everyone would be broke because yep. know, I write a lot. And, you know, I could just fucking, that was just what had to be done. That's what made, that was the sacrifice. That was one of many sacrifices, you know, as the leader of the band, you got to make to make no, to, it is to make it to do what you fucking accomp want to accomplish. Yeah, I mean, Will and I own the business, right? Right. So, you know, we've we've rotated a few players around, and you know, now we have a really stable group of guys. Like everybody's insanely good. Like not even just oh, that playing, just yeah. that being people. Yeah. You know, like great guy. Everybody's like easy to get along with for the most part, except for me. I'm probably the most difficult for sure. But like we're all like on the same page at this point, especially after this last tour, like realizing that the work is starting to pay off, you know, but if you as a business owner, don't look at your business as a business and don't realize like, okay, this band is a business. So we can keep all the money and that'll be great. And we'll have some money for two records but you or we keep a band. A really right. We keep a really good group of guys on by evenly distributing the money. So everybody has a fair shake so everybody can pay their bills and get through. Like I'm so honest with the guys about the money that it's like, I put the numbers on the table. The paperwork is there. You guys can check the bank account. Like, I just want you guys to know I'm never paying you any more than me and Will are making or I'm paying you any less than we and me and Will are making at any given time is what I should say. So we always try to keep it on the level. So everybody feels like they're getting a fair shake too many bands out there. Don't do that. And 20 years, I mean, your band is, uh, like I said, I bought Burn My Eyes in 1994, I think that record dropped, right? My yep. senior year of high school, and you're still making records, and you still have a band, and of course, bands go through turmoil, and, you know, people leave, people come, people go, people have differences, but, like, if you can have a longevity for 20, 25 years, it means you're doing something right, you know? So, what's the model? The model is that you want to treat it as a business and not be greedy. And if you can do those two things, you can successfully move a band forward, even if it's in little increments like we did. I mean, we have six records out, you know, and we're just starting to make a little bit of noise now. And it, it takes time. You know, you got your instant successes that, you know, do the thing overnight and it's amazing. Right. And then you have bands that have to crawl to the top. And the instant, instant success always burns out quick. It always happens, right? But if you got to crawl to the top and you got to work hard, like that'll always pay off in the long run. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it's a tough thing, man, but I, let's be honest. There's it's some about, really it great is about reinvesting though. You know, like that's how I look sure. at it. And I remember, I remember Steve Harris was talking about this. Like I read an interview when I was a kid and it was like, it's just about reinvesting into the band. You know, like you can take the money. Yes, you can. You know, there's nothing to stop you, but you know, if you want your band to grow, you've got to just constantly reinvest back into your band whether it be through yep. players or through gear or through, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it needs to, yeah. to get to where well, it is. you do a light show the, the first time you can do it. And then you add CO2 and you add a couple of other production things and then you keep pushing. And then you, it, when we get pyro, just so you know, I'm fucking quitting. That's it. <laughs> as soon as fire is on the stage, I'm doing that tour and then I'm done because I've been, I mean, it's not true, but I've been waiting my whole life to have pyro on stage. That's my, that's my life's goal at this right. point is to get us big enough. So we'd have fucking pyro every night. You know what I mean? Nice. But, and you know, but like, that's what you have to do. Better equipment, better players, better in, a, in the players. You hope you keep the same team, but I mean, chances are it's not going to happen. It's just people have differences and life happens to people outside of the band. And, and that's going to change over time there's very few bands out there that are still rolling with the same original members. You know what I mean? So it's a bummer, but it does happen. So like you have to put the time into the show. You have to give back. You have to make people tell their friends about how crazy your show was. You know what I mean? And when those things right. start happening, that's how you grow. You know, your music will take you far, but only as far as you're willing to push it. And it's hard we're being very negative in some ways about this. I don't think so. You know, I think, but, I think it's a really interesting conversation. You know what I mean? Like, I yeah, think well, that, like we, we could sit here and like play up the mythology of rock and roll, which has been done to death at this point. You know, yeah. like there's so much like the fucking, I'm so sick of hearing the Led Zeppelin stories at this point. Like they're over told. 
you know. Yes. You know, even yeah. to some degree, the Pantera story is over told, you know, at this point. Like, sure. And it's very, very mythology. I toured with Pantera back in 97. I know what was going on. It's very mythologized. In a mytholo- yeah. It's like a lot of mythology I mean, at this point. It's just, it's one of those things where like, it's going to work or it's not. Yeah. And, and, and it only works if you're willing to, if you're willing to bend a little bit on certain things. I mean, I think if I learned to shut the fuck up once in a while and not like express my opinions and like argue and do things that I do or did in the beginning of our career, we would have moved forward like pretty quickly or at least a lot quicker than we did. But I was, I was difficult. I wanted things the way I wanted it. And I argued to the death over things that looking back, like just didn't matter, you know? So you got to pick and choose where you want to end up and how you want to get there. And, you know, I'm happy that we, you know, stood our ground and kept doing what we were doing and, you know, refused to do the cheesy videos and refused to, you know, bite at the bit for the things that they wanted us to do. When I say they, it's people that we worked with at those times and stuck to where we're at and made what we do a thing that people want to see, you know, know in my opinion though, like I think that, you know, often, uh, a record company or a magazine will, will portray somebody as difficult. Oh, that guy was so difficult or whatever. And cause, and it's like, mm-hmm. it's a manipulation, you know, like they want their one way and you don't want your way. So you're difficult. <laughs> and it's like, I mean, you know, you're difficult because you want me to do this fucking ridiculous thing that I don't yeah. want to fucking do. <laughs> like, I don't want to play guitar in the woods, dude. That's not what I do. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? And like, exactly. Like you're, yeah whatever your vision is and you know like look man all the fucking best artists have fucking sharp elbows and rough edges you know that's just the fucking way it is you know like you want to fucking be your band you want to keep your vision that's what you have to do and it's gonna rattle only sway so far it's gonna piss people off because that person thinks they know better than you and whatever you know like Time tells well, we, whether you were right or they were right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's funny. Like there are some really great things. Like there's some companies that we work with and some people that we work with that are awesome. Like nuclear blast has been unbelievable. And they really are making it simple. Like we haven't had any issues like this in years and years. And to be completely yeah. honest, we just shut that stuff down so fast that it was never really an issue. Yeah. It's just like, we refuse to do it. And there's just no discussion. You can't make me, if you don't want to give me the money, to do what I want to do, then I'll just get the money and do it myself, yeah. you know? And then, you know, so we never really had to worry about that too much, but nuclear blast is super easy. Um, I started working with Jackson uh, and that's been absolutely unbelievably incredible. Like the, the team is great. Like Mike Tempesta is the guy, like I'm, I'm very lucky yeah. to be. Yeah. Mike is rad, dude. The, the mm-hmm. whole team over there has been sick. And, you know, there's a lot of companies that we work with that are really, really cool and make it easy to do what we do. So it's not all a struggle. You know, I don't want to sound like a cranky old man. I got a lot of really great things for music and I'm lucky to be doing what I'm doing. And I know, you know, how lucky we are. I don't think you sound like a cranky old man. I think, you know, like I I do think that it's, you know, I think people do need to hear about the sacrifice. I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of people think that being in a band is just like, you know, it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And the second that you put out your record, like you're making millions of dollars, and you've got a bathtub full of shiny naked women and fucking cocaine line. You know, like you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, I wish people could really that come and That's, see. That is the myth that, like, is, every, you know, many bands have perpetrated the Zeppelins, the Motley Crues, the everything. And you know, sure, maybe that was the case. Maybe at some point it was, or maybe it's just fucking the mythology of rock and roll, and it sounds really good, right? Like. It's more like a bunch of sweaty dudes packed into a small backstage area, warming up on guitars right. and like, <clears throat> like Party. drinking seltzer water. And, you <laughs> know, it's, just, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, the, the fucking backstage area smells like somebody took a crap on it. It's not. It, there's nothing cool about it in, yeah. in that, and you, in that and you, sense and you, of the word. And you just rolled down in your bandwagon or your bus on your on the bumpy ass fucking freeway where like every yeah. you know hour you got you hit a fucking pothole that was two feet deep and fucking threw you to the top of the fucking bunk and woke you up. And like, you know, <laughs> you know, like, Dude, I fell I fell out of my bunk three times. Oh in my the last god! Yeah. I I take the bottom bunk on purpose because right. like I'm like I'm a wide dude like I got big shoulders so like. 
I barely fit in those things, like sleeping in a coffin. So then you hit a bump and you like roll out of the fucking thing. It's like, people, you know, but whatever I got to do to get to the next gig, fuck it. Let's go. Are you, you know, so, what I mean? let me ask you this. So you're on the bottom bunk where, like, if you walk into the bus, are you on the bottom left, bottom first, right? First, bottom left. Bottom okay, left first guy. bottom left. All right, all right. So not, yeah, so the, this not way the back, with, not the second row in the back. No, I, I like I like being by the front door. Okay. But uh, yeah, this way, next time we're on tour, you know what bus to dump your uh, bunk to dump your drink <laughs> into to get me out of bed. But uh, <laughs> get up. it's it's crazy, man. I'll like, be sober and I'll be hammered and I'll just come in and be like, come on, Patrick. <laughs> that's my life, dude. I, being being the straight edge guy on tour is hilarious because you remember all the drunk shit. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? You remember like Hosian got hammered on this tour and woke up the next day and he's got like a very thick accent and he's like, who the fuck ate my sandwich? And I'm like, you ate your sandwich. <laughs> like, we all watched you eat your sandwich last night. Like that's the tour stuff. You know what I mean? Right, right. Like, that's what happens on the road. Like dudes get drunk and forget that they ate their food and they get mad at everybody the next day. Cause right. you ate it on there, you know, like shit like that. There's no like, like parties and like piles of cocaine and naked people and like sin and all this stuff. It's more like dudes FaceTiming their girlfriends and like people bringing <laughs> puppies in for us to play with. And like, it's, I swear to God, like you're like, and you see joke. a puppy and you're like, Oh my God, I miss my dog. Like, like this is the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like laying on the ground in Berkeley of all places, like petting a dog because I haven't seen my dog in so long. Like that's our big party night, you know, like, right. Oh, maybe we'll go get a good meal and somebody will fall down drunk on the way back and we'll, laugh at him for a week most of you guys don't even most of your guys are pretty sober too right like your guitar player doesn't drink right tim and i are both straight edge yeah yeah um blue and jose and just like their weed you know they're 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 into the leaf and joe's the same way yeah. no real big drink like jose and has a few beers every now and then and yeah. you know joe will go out and drink like once or twice on a tour but for the most part we're just trying to manage being able to play an hour and a half long set every night and like right just keep it together, you know? So I think once you get past like 26, 27 years old, and you've been touring as long as we all have, it just, the, the, the idea of like being cranked out on tour just gets old real fast. Like being able to wake up at, you know, 11 o'clock and go all the way through till 3 a.m. and have the stamina to do that. Like that all gets, once you have to do that, years, it, yeah. Yeah, for seven weeks, you know. And then the funny thing is, it's like you get there's always one guy on tour who's like, whether he's like a a crew guy or a dude in a band or something that can get like fucking nailed every night and be up in the morning before everybody yes. loading. And like I'm I'm watching our, you know, one of the guys on the tour, I'm not gonna say who, but the dude is like a party animal. He's like hammered every night like having fun off running around, just gone bus calls at 3 AM. He gets there at five minutes to three. You know what I mean? Like he's that guy. I wake up in the morning. There's like a half empty box of liquid IVs sitting on the thing. And he's just awake and raring to go and like doing his job. Like I could never do that. Awesome. You know, yeah. I would, I would fucking fall you know, apart. I love those crew guys. Yeah. They, they, they do They're it right. Road man. Do- those are the road dogs right there. Yeah, for real. Like they, that's, that's a dude that is just like seasoned professional, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and it, being the first time that we've ever had like a, a, a crew be, albeit small, you know, we had a drum tech, uh, um, a light guy and a sound guy. And it, it was like a whole nother world. All, you guys are all teching for yourselves basically. Yeah. We all tech for ourselves. I mean, the fact is, is we could probably afford to bring a guitar tech, but it's like, we would have to pay that person a good wage and it would cut into us living comfortably. Yeah. So that's hopefully in the future, you know, it would be nice. We're, yeah, plus you got, we're going to be got doing loaders. You got loaders at the venue to help load in the gear and load out and stuff. So most, most times, you know, yeah. sometimes they don't show or they don't, it's not in the budget if we're playing like somewhere in like fucking Wichita or Iowa or something like that. Right. The budgets are a little tight and we, we just do it ourselves. I change my own strings and set up my own guitars and, I enjoy doing that stuff on the road. It's like something to focus on and take your head out of the clouds a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So a routine, like your routine too, you know, like you, you're in a routine. Like yeah, okay, 14 four. gallons of coffee. 
Right. It's four <laughs> o'clock. Know? I got to change my strings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dude, I got real lazy on the last tour. Like the last two weeks, I like kind of like slacked off a little bit. And one night I was playing and I could just feel the strings were just destroyed. And I was like, man, I'm going to end up in a bad situation. So I went to change the strings. And as I was loosening my A string, the low A, it just fucking snapped off the thing. And I was like, oh, man, like that could have been a catastrophe live. So kind of learned my lesson on that. But yeah, it's it's a good routine, man. It, it, it certainly helps. But. There's there's not enough time in a day to do all the shit that we have to do anyway. So, I remember when I was in violence, I would go. We were doing the same thing. We were like we were in a van, all of all of our gear, all of our luggage, all seven of us. You know, we had a we had a our manager lady, this Debbie Abono, and then uh, our other it was like the two managers, and he also did sound and helped us, you know, bring in gear and stuff. But I had a Floyd Rose, so you know, a Floyd Rose, you don't necessarily have to change the string. You can just clip the string and then just reinsert it into the thing. So I yeah, made yeah. like one pack of strings last like two weeks you know, <laughs> before it finally got to the <laughs> very, very end, and I had no more string to attach at the top. Right. <laughs> like, so, so basically, you would have like by the time the flat spot from the nut got to the third fret. Yes. It, was, <laughs> yes. it was like, okay, I got to change the fucking string now. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Jesus. I mean, you know, dude, I love like bringing, bringing in gear, bringing in the head, you know, setting it up. Like you're done. I literally <laughs> would keep my guitar case on stage right there. And I would just, I'm done. I would just stick it in the case, grab my head, grab my guitar case back out to the van, you know, yep. driving. that's how it is, man. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're doing good, but we're not doing as, you know, some people think we're doing better than we are. We got to, we still got to, you know, self-serve. We do a lot of things on our own and I kind of like it that way. I mean, don't get me wrong. It would be wonderful to wake up at 1 PM and walk into a fully, you know, furnished stage setup and everything's done. But I kind of also enjoy the whole, you know, like you said, the routine, it, it makes it feel more hands-on and more real. I, I kind of enjoy it. Yeah. So. I say that now, but my back would really love not to have to pick up my rig every day. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, look, I'm I'm the most grateful dude in the world that I can. I, it's a luxury that I get to walk in and my shit's already set up and my dude's already there. Yeah. And, you know, I make my own yeah. routines with whatever warming up or just focusing on playing and you know to do it that mm-hmm. way. And you know, I'm I'm lucky. You know, like I'm fucking incredibly lucky to do it, and I don't ever take it for granted <laughs> because I had to fucking share the bed with phil nimmel <laughs> you know like oh with, yeah yeah with those days when you're in that motel six and debbie abono is in the mm-hmm. one bed and it was phil and i in the same bed because that's all we could afford was fucking two rooms and there was seven people you know? well, right up until this tour that's what we were doing right, right up until the bandwagon you know we were we were like getting two or three hotel rooms and you know a couple of guys were sharing beds and yeah you got yeah, it's it. just the way it went yeah. yep and there's a lot of really great memories from those times too you know what I mean? Totally. So, and you don't want to, but, like, uh, at least back then, you didn't want to sleep on the floor of a Motel 6. <laughs> like, no, it was no, fucking, no, 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 no. It was fucking, no. you'd, wait, you'd wake up with roaches crawling across your face. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the like, cockroaches like, carry you outside into the hallway and get you out of their room. You know what I mean? They mug you. <laughs> they fucking, they <laughs> Where's my wallet? <laughs> like, fucking little cockroach son of a bitches. Took my wallet. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff man you know it's funny you texted me and uh you were talking about how you wanted first of all i wanted to go back when you were in your 20s was there ever a partying raging patrick sheridan era when you were on tour with fit for an yeah. autopsy yeah uh no no because I, I was never on tour with fit for an autopsy in my 20s okay. i was fit for an autopsy has been a band for about 15 oh, right, right, yeah. years now yeah. So I was in my 30s, I think I'm 32 or 33 when that band started, but there was definitely a uh, a, a party pat for a little while. <laughs> party pat. Yeah, yeah. Party pat's not. That I wasn't sounds a like, nice That sounds guy. like an official nickname. It was. It was. Yeah. <laughs> party pat. It, it it went away, and then uh, I recently planned. <laughs> this is how things have changed. Um, alcohol and drugs made me party pat from 18 to 22, 23, and uh, planning my friends. Uh, wife's baby shower made me party pat okay, <laughs> at, at, uh, at 46 <laughs> so that's the difference but um yeah I, I partied for a little while and I and I got in some trouble and I realized that I was better off not being around that stuff so around 23 years old I gave everything up and I just never went back and now I'm 46 and I probably could have a drink or 
you know, do, you know, recreational weed or whatever, but like, I've been not doing it for so long. Like, what's the point? I, I like being sober, you know, I like where I'm at and, you know, the whole straight edge thing, like people like, Oh, why do you have to label it? And it's like, well, you know, like as much as everybody hates it, it's also nice to know that there's something out there for people that aren't interested in that. Like there's a community thing like, Oh, how do you not drink? It's like, well, dude, if you can't have a day where you don't have a beer, like that could be a problem, you know, way worse than me being like, I don't need to drink. You know what I mean? So are you it, in a band, right. when you're party Pat, are you in a band? Are you playing shows? Are you, or is this just like what, back then? Oh yeah. yeah. I've, I've been in bands since I've been playing shows since 94, you know, touring in hardcore bands and punk rock bands and doing that whole thing. So there was a point in time where sometimes shows didn't happen when we got there and we, we got, you know, t- tuned out enough. I mean, you know what New Jersey was like for a long time and the, uh, Oh, I just lost your video. Oh, there you are. Hang on. There we go. We, you know what shows were like there, and it could get pretty crazy. And it was fucking you know, wild. It was the wild west back then, man. It was, it was, it was a crazy place. So, you know, but I've, I realized, you know, in my late twenties, that uh, I, there's a better version of me that I would like to portray. So I've been working on that for a really long time, and I think not doing drugs and not drinking and, and not being around a certain element really helped me kind of hone in on who I wanted to be. And, uh, you know, it's not for everybody. Some people can go their whole lives and be casual and, and do it. And I just know that I'm the kind of person that's either 110% in or 110% out. And so that's it. That's the only reason I gave it up. And, you know, could you imagine my personality on cocaine? <laughs> could you, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, like I can, and I can't because sometimes there's like, I used to, I had a buddy, he passed away. Uh, from drug use, but uh, he was he, he was he was my guitar tech. His name was Jack Cargyle, and he was the loudest, funniest, craziest fucking dude you've ever fucking met. Like hilarious and like always on. You know what I mean? Like a fucking <clears throat> on 10, 24 hours a day, and like he'd do coke, and he became the worst human that you ever. Like he was just like quiet, didn't want to really want to talk, and like if he did, everything was always like in this kind of a voice, and I'm just like, what the fuck happened to you? Like, you suck on cocaine. Like this, Yeah. Is, you know, so yeah. Maybe, I'm just not good. like that, you know? Like, I, I, You know what? At this point, I don't want to know. Right. I, I just, <laughs> I'm afraid to find out what it were would you be doing, like. You know? Were you doing coke back then? Like, were you like party partying? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was a party guy. Yeah. And we, uh, we, we did a little bit of everything uh, yeah. right up until it was time for me to get away from it. I mean, I never messed with like heroin or anything like that. I never took that road, but I, I dabbled in a little bit of everything, but it wasn't long enough for me to really get involved in anything too much. Like I, I did, I did my fair share of enough things to realize that it was just bad for me. You know what I mean? So I hear stories about like cocaine, like real cocaine stories. For me, it was just like once in a while thing. But I mean, yeah. I also knew people that were raging on it every weekend. Yeah. You know what I, I mean? Think, I, I think, think I think your brother, you, when I met your brother in New York, when you guys played with Hank Reed. Yeah. That yeah. you were saying that he was like a rager back in the day. Like, old yeah, he was a rager and I followed in his footsteps for a little while. Right. And that's kind of how it started. Like, I mean, in, I mean, and he took me to my first show in 1986. That's I saw cyanide silo and Abaraxis. Oh, wow. And I, this, yeah. Like, bunch of thrash metal bands at this like small venue in new jersey and then exodus and dri the following weekend oh shit. so yeah I, I just dove straight in and I, that's the kind of person i was like and i was 10 years old Holy like i was fuck, that's really I, nice. I was a baby when i first i mean i i was like born into it because my brother was super into it. i mean there was a point in time where we were seeing Slayer like three or four times a year. We were going to all these shows. Like Slayer's a band I've probably seen more than any other band on earth for sure. And like I was a young kid being exposed to all this stuff by my brother. And then I would say around 87, 88, I discovered like New York Hardcore, the Chromax record I had, had in like late 86. So like I just started developing this taste for so many different kinds of extreme music. And like, and I was around so much chaos all the time that if I would have dove in the way my brother dove in, I would be a different person now. You know what I mean? And I think watching how he was for a little while made me realize that maybe I just wanted to dabble in it and not maybe go as hard. And then I had a friend who I found out was freebasing 
and his life fully fell apart. And I was just like, fuck, I'm never doing that. You know what I mean? I'm never getting that far. So I partied and then, you know, weed and drinking a lot up until my early twenties. And then I got in some trouble because I was drunk and I did something that I may not have done if I wasn't drunk. And I said to myself, okay, like it's time to cut the shit. Like I got to stop it. So I waited a year and then I just said, well, I've been, I feel good about this. And then I kind of adopted the straight edge thing and, and just went forward from there. So, you know, I don't do it for any particular reason, but I feel like it's good for me. And I, as a straight edge guy, I've probably bought more drugs for people as a straight edge guy You're than most people, buy, most people buy for themselves, you know, like. I don't give a shit what anybody else does. And, you know, you're going to do what you want. So I just, I just try to keep it as smart for myself as I possibly can. That's the only reason, you know, other than that, I'm, I'm not the kind of guy that's like, ew, you're, you're doing drugs. I'm like, oh shit, let's see where this goes. You know what I mean? Like you're not running around knocking beers out of people's hands or anything. I've never been into that whole thing. I don't, I don't care what people do. That's, that's I do things for me, you know? Tell me about, uh, Take me back to growing up, like as a okay. you know, young kid, New Jersey. You know, are your are, is your family musical at all? Do you have is your is your parents musical? No, um, I come from a pretty crazy background, like uh, pretty crazy family life. Um, you know, broken family, typical like mom struggling with kids, and you know, stepfather comes in the picture, and then he's working and doing all these things that he has to do as a long haul trucker. So he's just never really around. And I had a pretty, pretty wild childhood. You know, um, I was the only one in my family that ever really picked up music. I mean, my brother TJ occasionally does like, um, he makes like beats on his computer and stuff, but he's more into like, you know, electronic music, but my brother, Kevin and my sister, Michelle, who passed away a few years ago and my stepfather were all very into music. And my mother, too, to a certain degree, like she loved Motown, she loved disco, she loved all that stuff. So I got tons of that from my mom. And then my dad was like super into like old rock and roll, like lots of Black Sabbath, um, you know, old metal, too. And, you know, Led Zeppelin. But then That's also like, yeah. And then like, yes, and Rush and oh, okay. like all that. And then Journey and like he loved everything, you know, everything from like Jimi Hendrix and, you know, the whole Woodstock era all the way to like modern like kind of proggy stuff and you know steely dan is my all-time favorite band ever and that's wow. fully because oh yeah God, I, totally I mean did not see that coming <laughs> right and that's what everybody says but like if i'm if there's my go-to band steely dan 100 percent. like in my opinion um the song home at last is possibly the best song that's ever been written ever like that made my humble opinion but like so i had all that and then my sister was super into like 80s metal like poison bon jovi rat warrant like all that white snake oh, this is my first exposure to steve Vai and like all that stuff and then my brother kevin was into bands like we'll say violence and you know all of the thrash metal stuff and slayer and you know all these different bands that we were listening to coming up and like he got me into that so like I, my first records that i ever had was michael jackson's thriller yes. and venom Black metal, what did you first? <laughs> right, like Holy talk Lord. about a, a mess of a kid, right? I had like this little record player. They I mean, they're two great records, into, but only yeah. fuck, like polar yeah. polar ends of the spectrum there. Right, right, two awesome records, right? So like, were you like, were you like I, practicing all the Michael D Jackson dance moves, like in the mirror? Like, were you trying to move? No, on? I was a I was a chubby. A chubby, uncoordinated kid, dude. I, yeah, I didn't yeah. know anything about that stuff. Right. I just loved, I loved the music, you know, like oh, my God, mom was yeah. like, like being a kid and being exposed to things like Curtis Mayfield and Marvin Gaye and ZZ Top and Black Sabbath and, and like, you know, the Bee Gees and Venom and, you know, like Slayer and fucking Bon Jovi and Warren, like all these different things hit me at the same time. Like it was just crazy to like grow up like that. Yeah, you know, and I think it's awesome be, like, that you had so much exposure to Motown. You know, like I think you know, yeah, a lot of people don't that early like funk black music is just yeah. so fucking it's sick. You know, yeah, it, it, we we were exposed to like a lot of music that I think a lot of people that I knew had no idea about, and and I love that. You know, so it gave me this education, and and now when I listen to like 
like modern like hip hop or like you know anything i can hear all these influences in the music and where it's coming from so i love stuff even now like that a lot of people that are metal guys are like oh why do, why do you love that and it's just like i don't know it just feels right to me you know what i mean so that was my music um exposure you know and, and then my brother had a friend named chris muller who left his kramer guitar at my house and that was the first time that I ever had a guitar that I could pick up. And I was like, maybe like nine at that point. And I started fumbling around with it to the point where my neighbor was like, Hey, I have this acoustic guitar. You can take this. And then that's how it started by like 10 or 11. I was playing and by like 15, I was in the skate punk band. And then, you know, as I got older, I, I started playing the hardcore bands and it just evolved from there, you know? And, um, so my exposure to music was more the listening side than the playing side. My mom tried to get me to play the slide trombone. That's how bad it was. Right, right. She was like, you want to play music? Why don't you play in the school band? They need a slide trombone. I was like, I don't want to play. I, I did it for like a month. And then I was like, I'm done with this. This is right. dumb. You know what I mean? So, um, I think, yeah, that, there's nobody... I think that the parents though, like they, they don't like, we don't want you to play guitar, but if you want to play something, it's cool. And like, there's trombone at the school. So that's like a, yeah. a thing. <laughs> my parents had me God. playing, my parents had me play on the trumpet. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Kathy. I don't want to play this. This is bullshit. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's tough, but like, whatever it, it, I think my parents had a lot more influence on me musically than they realized they did, you know? So it's, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy growing up and like trying to like run backwards to figure out where it all started. But I, I just remember this perfect white Kramer pacer with a maple neck and maple board and just staring at it being like, I need to understand how this sounds like Eddie Van Halen. Like, how does this become that? Like, and then I just kind of started learning little bits and pieces and, you know, I was nine. So the guitar looked like massive on me, right. but, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things, man, that like, there's just, if it wasn't for my brother, Kevin and my sister, Michelle, I would have never really stuck with it. I think that they were my, you know, because coming from a crazy background and having the family be like the way it was, it, it just became my escape. You know, they, they pushed me, go play guitar, go play guitar, go play guitar. Don't worry about all this stuff. Go play guitar. And then once what, I started going you, to shows. You, what were you escaping from? I mean, I had a crazy childhood, man. Like I had, I guess when you come from a family that is struggling to keep the lights on and, you know, maybe not the best environment as far as like, the way kids are treated or the way that, you know, a kid should be treated, it becomes easy to find a way to hide from things. Do you know what I mean? It becomes easy to want to have a place to get away from and music became my thing. And then when I found shows, you know, me and my brother very much became a part of that community and, and started doing that because it's an escape from what I had going on at home. You know, um, I don't want to, sit here and like bad mouth my family, but like I, I've had, I had a very rough childhood, you know, to say the least. My, my mom was a young mother who was struggling to keep things together. And, you know, she had her own issues and my biological father, I still have very minimal, I mean, I haven't spoken to him since my son was six months old and so my kid's 11. Um, you know, like I had, I had a pretty crazy upbringing and um, it, it's, music is one of those things that took me away from that like for sure so when people connect with the music when you're on stage and you look down and you see some person like screaming the words back at you and you could tell that they're connected to that thing that's the heroine of of playing shows that's the dragon you know that you chase that's the thing for me because I didn't have a good life coming up when I, when I was younger, my, my best years of my life that I remember, like I was listening to people talk and they're like, Oh man, I wish I was back in high school. I'm like, fuck that. Like my wife <laughs> right. and my son and my music career, they're the best part of me. You know, like my friends now, my, my wife 
has changed my life completely. And like my son is, you know, giving him the things that I never had and making sure that he never feels that disconnect with his parents the way that I did. Like that's something that I get to enjoy as a parent. And I don't ever want to go back to high school. I don't ever want to be, you know, that kid that got picked on in school because I, you know, I listened to metal and punk rock and hardcore and rode a skateboard and didn't give a shit about being a football player. And I wanted to play guitar. Like, you know, when, when I was a kid and I'm sure when you were a kid, we were looked at as dirt bags, you know what I mean? Like fucking stoner metal dirt bags, scumbags, cut your hair, you know, you're a pussy, blah, 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 all this shit. Like, because I, I didn't fit into that whole jock mentality and I didn't want to be that person. And there's nothing wrong with playing sports. There's nothing wrong with being that person. It's just, way that I got treated because of what I chose to be. And um, so I, I never want to go back to that. I'm, I'm in a much better, you know, world right now, you know, and I don't know, man, I, I've lived through lots of bad shit, like abuse, uh, sexual abuse from a family member, like lots of pretty crazy things that have happened to me in my life that, you know, I, I think made me struggle up until my thirties you know, on who I wanted to be and what I wanted to be. So, you know, I'm not embarrassed to talk about it. It's just at this point in my life, I feel like when I visit it, sometimes I, I say things that, you know, my parents will probably hear this, you know, or, you know, somebody might tell them about it. And it's like, I don't want them to think I hate them. They, they did the best that they were mentally capable of doing, but it just wasn't good, you know, and the things that I've been through in my life, it's just, it goes a lot deeper than what a lot of people know. And if people ask me, I'll tell them, like, I've been on all sides of the spectrum. I was a super aggressive person. I've had people be super aggressive to me. Um, I was abused as a kid. I, I've, I've managed to functionally weave my way through all of these things and get to music. And music is the thing that saved my ass. You know, I became a tattooer because I met somebody in the music industry. I met my wife through music and tattooing. My friend base that I have in my whole life now is because of touring and playing music and meeting people. Like literally music saved me from the bullshit that was going on in my life. So it's, uh, it's, it's been a weird road, man, but it, it all leads back to the same place, you know? So. Yeah. Well, thanks for, uh, you know, I really appreciate you sharing what you just shared. You know, that's, pretty heavy to go through as a fellow sexual abuse survivor. I can yeah. totally relate to it and, uh, and understand, you know, I completely understand what you're talking about, you know, and how yeah. it fucks you up and you know, the shit. And you know, when I think about it now, it's, I'm detached from it and you know, uh, 362 days out of the year, I never even think about it, you know, and you know, yep. maybe every two days I did, you know, two days out of that year, I will think about it. Sure. Yeah, maybe it, it becomes a thing that you, won't. yeah, it becomes a thing that you, <clears throat> you learn to navigate. And something that I found that really helps for me is like, you can take all the bad shit you've been through your life and, and use it to be a victim. You know, I hate saying playing the victim role because some people really need to be at that point in their life and they need to get through. I did for a long time, but you have to find the springboard in there to shoot you forward. So every time that I start thinking about that stuff, I feel like it's holding me back. And if I continue to allow that to hold me back, everything else is going to hold me back. I'm never going to get to where I need to be. So I use that as like, okay, this was the bad stuff. Look at where I'm at. Look how far ahead I've gotten from that. And I use it as a springboard to continue moving forward. And that's the philosophy I keep with all of that. Like every time I let that situation happen, I'm letting that person that hurt me, hurt me again. And I'm way past that. So that's like, uh, for pe the crazy thing is, is that when I talk about that, it seems like most people that I talk about it say, yeah, I've been through something like that. Or, you know, I have people come to me to tell me these things and I tell them, look, look, I understand completely, you know? And, and some of the stories that I've heard are so much worse than what happened to me. And like, so I always try to remember like, you know, Hey man, like it, it, everything could have been worse. Everything could be way worse than it was. So, you know, in sharing it, it kind of helps me remember that I've gotten to the point that I'm at right now by not letting it hold me back. And 
you know, I appreciate you sharing with me that you've, you know, experienced that too. And I think it's important for people who have gone through any traumatic thing, whether it be with, you know, uh, a family member or whatever, that you can talk to other people about it, you know. And I went so far as to just, in a roundabout way, forgive the person that, that did what they did to me because what the hell did they go through to bring them to the point in their life that they would feel like they needed to do something like that? Like, what is their background like? Because I know what happened to me and what it made me be, and I wasn't good for a long time. So, you know, like, I, I try to, like, not be, not sympathize, but just understand, you know, like. Did you ever talk to your parents about it? Uh, yeah, there was counseling and therapy, and that might have been worse than <laughs> Than actually what happened to me, like the whole therapy thing, because at the time, like How old were you? I was uh, nine, I was nine years old. Yes. I was old enough. Yeah. I was old enough to realize that the therapist was just doing a job and, you know, the whole, oh, well, we're friends and tried to like break through whatever. And, and that kind of made it, made it seem real, you know, disingenuous. Like it just didn't feel real. So that was pretty hard. I think but, too, like your mind's probably just not even able to process i mean i w- i remember going my parents took me my, it might have it happened to me when i was five so my parents okay. didn't take me to therapy that, like we didn't do anything like we just never talked about it ever again yeah after it happened which like was in the long run 10 times worse because then it was just like i didn't you know like i had to process it all alone essentially and yeah. when i was 15 i started you know now i'm smoking weed i'm drinking i'm like a troublemaker you know like i'm mm-hmm. um, and so like they're like oh we need to take you to therapy because it's probably that and you know at that point it was like i was just like rebelling at that point i was like i don't fuck you fuck this person like i just lied like about yep. fucking everything like i'm not gonna fucking of tell course. you anything you know like i'm just fuck you i just want to get through this right and uh you know i didn't want to be there i didn't want to i didn't want to examine um by then I was probably just too angry about it. Mm-hmm. And I just, it does make you angry. Yeah. It does. It for sure makes you angry. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Weird. It's a weird thing you, to go so through. You, so you talked to your parents though, when you were nine, you, you, um, I told my brother, nine. okay. I told my older brother and my older brother went, then went to family member. I was like, Hey, this is happening. You know, we got lucky that it got caught at the time that it did. And so it would have a multiple. It could have, It could have been, it could have been way worse. Yeah. It was like edging towards getting to the worst point, you know, and my brother asked me a question about this person and I kind of was like, yeah. And he was like, what's going on? And I kind of laid it out and he was like, okay. And then he went to my grandmother and my mom and then this whole thing started. So yeah, it was pretty crazy. It was nuts. Like it's, it's, and it's, it's one of those things where, it, it becomes easier to deal with as it becomes more distant. But I remember being a kid and really, really struggling with a lot of things about it. So it was, uh, it definitely shaped me as a person in the younger years of my life. And it took me a long time to realize that I was allowing that to happen along with like, you know, my biological father abandoning me and all the other shit that was going on. Like it was just a, a lot, it was a big bag a full of issues and, you know, yeah, yep. like yeah I have, totally. I have a lot of all of those things <laughs> and it, it, <laughs> and it took me, it took me a long time, you know, even my wife still has to deal with it sometimes. Like, you know, and I tell her like, look, like I, I'm fucked up. Like, it's just, I'm, I'm a broken person. And I tell my kid that all the time, like, Hey, like, like I'm pretty broken dude. And I'm just trying my best to be good to you. So just be better at life than I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think that's important too, to be honest. So yeah, but I'm, I'm past a lot of that stuff and I can talk about it pretty freely as you can see. And it's, uh, it it is what it is. You know, you don't, you don't always ask for life to do things that happen to you. Sometimes life takes things from you, you know? And, um, so you get to choose kind of how that happens and how it doesn't happen. You know, at least you should. Yeah. I was asking you if you had told your parents because, you know, sometimes (laughs) don't, you know, sometimes people, you know, kids don't ever tell their parents and parents don't know until a long time later. And, I, don't, I think if my brother had never asked me, I would have never told anybody. And, yeah. it, and it probably would have gotten like way my worse. parents, my parents knew and I told my parents, but you know, we never spoke about it for, and then, and then finally, like at 30 years old, 
And I, I sang, I wrote a song about it on the Burning Red. The la- the second to last song is called Five, and that song and mm-hmm. Burning Red are basically about that. And uh, you know, so but at that point, I was like, I started going to therapy. I was talking about it, and uh, and then like I I was like, I gotta talk to my fucking parents about this finally. You know, about all because mm-hmm. we literally it's like literally it was just like didn't exist you know like every once in my dad be like hey you know that thing that happened like are you okay like yep okay <laughs> like it was it was just something <laughs> yeah. like something real yeah. benign like one word you yeah. know one sentence and like yep i feel like it's okay okay you know yeah but uh yeah you know it was yeah. it was trippy it was trippy to talk to my parents like you know being older you know like it was it was weird it was tough you know a lot of crying and a lot of fucking yeah uh, pissed off i was pissed off you know yeah, being vulnerable is bullshit, dude. It's it's tough. It's hard to deal with. And when when you're a kid at nine years old, like asking yourself questions like, well, why did this person want to do this? And why why me? And what am I putting out into the world that me, you know, at nine years old, like I shouldn't be trying to navigate through that shit. I should be like learning how to play guitar or playing video games or right, riding right. a skateboard. Totally. You know, I mean, so it, yeah, it totally makes you like you know, like your question, sexuality. I question my own sexuality at nine years old. I was just old. gonna say that, like you right. question your fucking sexuality, yeah. like what you know, that's nine years your first old experience, like what the fuck am I, you know? Yep, exactly, and and that's why I'm so comfortable with myself because like I've done all of that already. At a very young age, I had to like navigate through. I, I would say until I was like fourteen or fifteen, I didn't really understand what I was trying to navigate through. Yeah. But by the time I got to that point, that's why I. I don't, I don't judge anybody or, or, you know, people are going to live what the way that makes them comfortable. And I try to like, remember what I went through. Like, if I don't understand something, I just try to remember that I didn't even understand myself at one point in my life. So who am I to judge another person? And I'm not to say that I hadn't judged people before or done things before that I, you know, because I was lashing out and I was angry, but now I try to remember that, you know, there are a lot of people out there in this world that went through things like I did or worse. And you, you can't, you can't expect people to deal with things the way that you do. So I, I just try to always remember what I went through and like use that as like, um, I guess a way to just keep myself from pretending that I understand everything. You know what I mean? Cause right. things can happen to you and it can make you understand things so much less than you think you already do. So right. I don't know, I, but I, I also believe that if the things that didn't happen to me, if the things that happened to me didn't happen, I wouldn't have my wife. I wouldn't have my child. I wouldn't have my career. I wouldn't have been as driven to say, fuck you to everybody that told me that I couldn't do the things that I wanted to do because of the way I looked or where I came from. Like, <clears throat> you know, so, I mean, it was terrible. And yes, life could have been a lot easier, but would I be the person I am now? You know, which is a really crazy thing, way to look at that kind of a situation. Like who knows where we get our drive from right. and our ability to stand up for ourselves and the ability to do the things that we want to do, who knows where that comes from. So, and, and to me, it's all life experience, right? You're only going to be as strong or educated as the experience in life will allow you, Right. you know, Right. If somebody's dog passes away and then somebody else's mother passes away, but those are both the two worst things that have ever happened to those people, the feeling is going to be exactly the same. That feeling of loss is going to be exactly the same. So life experience takes you to that next level and you can only feel what you experience. So who am I to tell a person that what they feel is wrong? Not what they, not facts, yeah. just what they feel. Yeah, right. I, mean, so, so, I totally. totally agree. You know, like so many people yeah. put like emphasis on like you know fucking horoscopes or something. You know, like what yeah. your sign is, and I'm just like it's so got nothing to do. You know, like I've known people who were born same year, same day, couldn't be farther apart as human beings. I mean, just absolutely fucking polar I mean, opposites. Look at look at twins when twins are born. Right. Sometimes they're twins, so yeah. polar different. You know, and I mean, it's just. It is what it is. There's no rules to any of this. You're only going to be able to feel what you're capable of feeling. And and you're only going to be able to feel through your experiences as far as you've come in life. So I'm not any better or any worse than anybody else. When I talk, I talk about my experience and what got me through. And if that helps somebody, that's great. And if it doesn't, that's fine too. 
they're not wrong for not agreeing with me. And I'm not wrong for living the way that I live if I'm not hurting anyone. It just means that our approaches are different. I think the hardest thing for people to admit is that the way that things work for them is never going to be the same as it works for somebody else. It doesn't make it wrong or right. It just means it's different. You know what I mean? If you're not a piece of shit, if you're not hating people or hurting people, if you're not a, you know, go through the list of bad, terrible things that you can be, if you're just living your life the way that you're living it and somebody doesn't agree with what you're doing, like if you're, if you live with uh, your partner, but you're not married or, you know, your, your partner is, you know, uh, same sex marriages or all these things that people pretend to affect people like that doesn't affect anybody, but the two people that are involved in those things. So don't judge those people. Let those people live their lives and be happy. Like mind your own fucking business. <laughs> mind, exactly. Mind your own fucking business. Right. Don't, like don't the get so- involved. Society has turned in the nosiest fucking society ever. Like fucking mind your own business. Right. Just because it's not right for you doesn't make it wrong. It just means that it's not right for you. And let those people be fucking happy and shut up. Like it doesn't need to be this thing. So I always try to remember that my way is never going to be anybody else's way. And, and me and my wife have been together for almost 14 years now. And we, we experience that all the time. There's things that make her tick and things that make me tick that are different. She's not wrong. I'm not wrong. It just means it's, you have to accept it and that it's different and then move forward from there, you know? People are ignorant, especially when it comes to how other people live and what other people need to get past their bullshit, you know? So I don't know, man, we live, there's so many ways to look at life. And personally, I've been through enough shit to just know that I don't care what people think about me anymore. I don't care what you think about the way that I need to do things. If I'm not hurting anyone and I'm not doing anything shitty to anyone and I'm not making your life any more uncomfortable, we don't need to talk about it. You know what I mean? It's you have your way, I have my way and we just go live and then that's it. You know what I mean? And it shouldn't matter. Whatever. Uh, To change the subject to something something a little lighter. uh, Okay. Last time we spoke, you were working out. You had a pretty big workout routine that you were doing. And granted, mm-hmm. this pre-pandemic, I'm not sure if you're still able yeah. to go to a gym or whatever. So, Well, I wasn't able to go to a gym for a while, and I put some weight back on because I was stagnant. I couldn't do anything. But now I'm back at it again, and I'm training five days a week again, and I'm losing weight nice. and nice. getting fit again. I mean, I, I never got back to being, you know – almost 400 pounds, which was great that I didn't do that, but I put like 40 pounds back on. Yeah. So it happens quick. And you know, uh, now I'm just back to working again. I'm back on my meal regimen and, you know, working you out five you, days a week. Do you find that you lose weight while you're on tour? Yes. Yeah. I lost like 12 oh, pounds on tour. I fucking, yeah. I'm in the best shape of my life when I'm on tour. Like, yep. <laughs> like it's when yeah. I get home that everything goes to shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, we were doing 150 days a year and I was averaging like 10,000 steps a day. Right. And then COVID hit and I was averaging like 10 steps a day. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know what I mean? No, I, but I'm just saying like I was trapped in my house. So I was trying to work out in my garage and right. it just got to the point where I couldn't do it anymore. And I just put a bunch of weight back on. But then I started training with my buddy, that guy that you met, Josh, in oh, okay. when we were in Berkeley. Right. He is a per, uh, personal trainer and I started working with him, so that oh, right that regimen that we I were thought doing. He was talking about how he was living in Florida, and he hated it because <laughs> he was like, the, "Yeah, he, 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 like, did. he found he a Nordstrom's, and he was just like, oh, my God, a North candles, <laughs> like, culture.'" <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, he got the hell out of there, and he got he back was, to the He was a really team. funny dude, man. He was so fucking yeah. funny. He's a great human, and nice um, and he he really got me back on track. So I've been working hard again, and I'm eating like five six times a day again, and like awesome. watching my watching my calorie intake and drinking lots of water and, you know, trying to like, trying to really work hard on, on getting back in shape again. I don't know if I want to get down as small as I was, but cause I got really small for a little while. I think I'd like to live at like the 220, 225 area somewhere because, you know, I got down to like 209 and I saw pictures of myself, man, I look like a, like a toothpick. And I know that's just me looking at myself, but like, you know, I, I felt weaker. I feel stronger than I've ever felt my whole life right now. So it's, uh, it's definitely, 
it's definitely something I got to work on, but we're getting back there. You, uh, you texted me the other day about, uh, what'd you say here? What'd you, you wrote something about, I think you wrote something about burn my eyes or something. That's the whole, the whole, oh, yeah, the yeah. whole reason that you came on the podcast is because, uh, you and I were texting back and forth about, yep. uh, what did you text me? Uh, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> it's way back here. We had a was long, it was it me? Long was it about my post? We had a long text conversation ever since this. Yeah. I want to say it like you texted me a picture of burn my eyes, and you were like, "Yeah, yeah, I, I, dude, that's a record that never since the first time I heard it that never ever leaves my rotation." I remember the first time I heard Davidi and I threw a table across my living room. You know what I mean? Like my, it was my mom's <laughs> living room. Actually, I was living at home, but like. Um, that, Your that mom record, must have been like, what the fuck, Patrick? <laughs> God damn it, Rob Flynn. But, um, yeah, like, uh, Byron, that, my son that to break my furniture. Yeah. I mean, that, that era of music was like when like bands started being really heavy, really, really heavy. And, um, I had put up a post about like how that was one of my records in high school and how, like, well, just maybe, that's what, it was. maybe like, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, just saying to people, like, what was your go-to record? And everybody's like, I love this record, this record, and this record. Like, talking about how important that record was at the time that it came out. And I just said, it's funny, like, I feel like I've known you since I was 18 years old. You know what I mean? Like, listening to those records. And I mean, think about that era. You know, that's what Biohazard was releasing, all that ridiculously yes. heavy stuff. Urban yes, Discipline came, totally. came out around that same time. And, like, all the Pantera stuff was dropping. And... Like white heavy zombie, music white zombie stuff was dropping. Yeah. Sepulchre, yep. yeah. Chaos AD. Sepulchre, ridiculous records at that time. And like, that was just such a great time for heavy music. It's something, and, and I visit that record like probably at least once every other month. I, I spend some time with that record. Which one? It's just a good one, you know, that, that, the, that burn my eyes. Oh, wow. Burn my eyes and the blackening are my two favorite eras of, mm -hmm. of your band, you know. And, yeah. but 10 Ton Hammer is like, that's a ripper, dude. That song, that song is super heavy. I told you how we wanted to cover it. Right. We found out right. that a band that has a, a band name very close to ours covered it. And we were just like, ah, we can't do it. What band is that? Uh-oh, you're frozen. Uh-oh. Hey, G-Mike, maybe edit this. It looks like he's frozen. We've dropped him. Well, let me text him. Looks like I lost you, comma. Oh, did I lose you? Yeah. Go back in. Oh, there, there you are. You're back. So, okay. nope, yeah, cool. we're back there in. All right, cool. So, yeah, so they're they're a deathcore band from the UK, and their name has the word autopsy in it. Oh, right. And we okay. started right around the same time, like same era, but they were in the UK, and we were here, so we hadn't really heard of each other. Okay. So, um we, you know, we have the word, having the word autopsy in your band name and, and covering the same song <clears throat> is unacceptable to me. <laughs> no, so, too much. but yeah, so we just never did it. We were talking about doing it for um, a split that we did and we actually ended up doing a nine inch nail song instead. That's cool. Which is yeah. pretty crazy. I'd love yeah. to hear your, I'd so, love to hear your cover of it though. Even if it's just like a rehearsal or something. It would, bad. It would be fucking heavy. I promise you that much, oh, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Could so you imagine your band, band? Your band tuned in Drop G. Yes. That's what it would be. It would be yeah. so heavy, dude. Yeah. No, so like, we yeah. used to we used to sound check with Davidian once in a while. But um, yeah, I I don't know. I, it was, it was a great I've era heard... for music. It was a great era for music. You know, like there was a lot of uh, experimentation. You know, I think labels were still like underground labels were still they had kind of started taking on that role where they would they would invest in a band to watch it grow you know like kind of what yep. majors labels used to be in the 70s and 80s you know where they could develop like, you know, you. like yeah they could develop you for three records and be like okay this might work then you know bigger major uh, bigger underground labels like roadrunner you know nuclear blast century media started doing the same thing which was pretty unheard of and kind of a wild time and was killer because of it yeah yeah, and they had the money to invest, and, and bands were, you know, music, metal music back then. I remember the Pantera era where, like, they blew up and the shows just got, <laughs> yeah, like, bands bands were able to, like, play big shows, like, yeah. because 
they were doing huge, massive shows. So there were more people, more people, more people going and going and going. And, you know, that comes in waves, like, like everything else, like metal does great for a few years and then it dies out and it comes back. And, but that era, there were so many good fucking bands in that era that the shows were wild and it was always a big show. And like, there were bands that would go out and tour with the big bands and then come back around and they were still pulling five, 600 kids a night and the smaller tours. Yeah. So it was always crazy back then. Yeah. But I mean, I saw your band, we talked about it at play at the stone pony. I saw you guys right. play at Birch Hill nightclub. You know what I mean? I saw you play in these smaller, more intimate venues. And then I've seen you play in like huge rooms. Yeah. So it's, it, that era was great. That was great. I mean, dude, I saw the Deftones play the stone pony. I saw right. corn play the stone right, pony. Right, right. I saw all of For all of you bands. who don't know the stone pony is like 900 cap maybe you know like not even very not famous, even that's like very famous rock and roll venue bruce springsteen started there you know like he's famous for that you know yeah it, it was a really small venue but like it but when they didn't open the outside doors it held maybe 500 people okay so it was it was a small room and then when you Did guys played there it later on because i remember the, i want to say when we first played it it was really small but then at some point we played it later on in life and it was bigger yeah and there's yeah. these two garage doors that open to an outside patio okay and they have what's called the summer stage so okay. it's like this huge outdoor thing but what they would do when bigger bands played to make the capacity bigger they would open those two doors and then people could still see the stage from the outside okay on, on you know inside so when you guys, the second time I saw you guys play there, you had the doors open and there was a ton more people. But the first time I saw you guys play there, it was just a small show. Yeah, it and was it was us and a bunch of hardcore bands. Yeah, it was incredible, incredible time. So it's you know, music is it it, it comes you know it comes and goes. It, it moves forward in ways where you know you wouldn't expect it. But that era was definitely crazy. And like those the bands, man bands were something different what at sepultura chaos ad or sepultura roots yes you gotta pick one you can no, only I pick one no, i don't <laughs> have to do anything you one. tell me <laughs> um you can only pick would, one beneath the remains i don't know um mm -hmm. arise uh, arise but no i would say uh chaos ad probably yeah because it got a little weirder and heavier and you know, it, that's a great record. So, yeah, it's a fucking great record, top to bottom, like top yeah, to I mean, fucking bottom. I mean, dude, we could we could do this game. You know, like I play this game with my brother all the time, and you know, I ask people like, "What's your favorite Slayer record?" You know what I mean? Yeah. And then it, it, that's a hard one to pick because a really the three record, one. the three record pocket is my favorite. You know, Rain, South of Heaven, and Seasons. Or, or like see, my, I would, I would lump hell awaits into there because that record was so fucking yeah. pivotal for me, you know. And I'd sure. I sure, I mean, I might skip out to heaven and just go right over to cut, <laughs> cut it out, cut it out. I know you but can't I mean, skip out. Like, seventh, I love South to Heaven. Don't get me wrong, dude. I mean, live on dead, Ghost of live War. on dead is on that record. Yeah, Ghost of right? War, fucking yeah, I mean, South to Heaven. I mean, dude, fucking Silent Scream, like fucking dude, uh, incredible record. Suicide, like you can't like you know. I'm just saying, like yeah. Hell awaits, though. you know, fucking Hell awaits, incredible. And Dawn they sleep and fucking yep. you know. yeah, yeah, all those records. I mean, they're all great. Well, I stop. Oh man, I'm gonna say something bad on here. I. I kind of stopped paying attention for a little while when God hates us all hit. Okay. It just, it didn't grab me, mm -hmm. but like, That's okay. even you can say the, that you can say that, you know, it's so annoying to me that no one like fucking feel like they, they can say like, I didn't like this record. I love black Sabbath. My favorite like band of all time, but fucking never say die and technical ecstasy suck. <laughs> like, okay. I don't know about uh, suck, but no, I, get, I get why you don't Those love it. Well, here suck. you go. You want, they're you want still me to my piss favorite band here? of all time, though. Slayer, I'll, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite band sure. of all times. Probably yeah. seen them more than I'm, anybody else. But they got a couple stinkers. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something that's gonna piss off your whole fan base. <laughs> the Ronnie James Dio era of Black Sabbath is what? better than everything else. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, dude. I'm sorry. Hey, listen, I'm sorry. Now. listen, listen, dude. Listen, Mob dude. rules, heaven and hell. Sick, unbelievable records two okay all-time classics unbelievable but listen but is it classics than wise the first three are you kidding me? yes 
Yes, it is. I'm not taking away from the importance and the history and that the songs are amazing. They're still amazing. But all of the people in Black Sabbath stepped their game up to work with Ronnie James Dio. They were like, this guy has the best guitar players, the best drummers. Listen to how technically proficient and advanced the music gets from oh, the dude, last. Those are fucking great albums, you know, like fucking. It's the best guitar Line of the playing. Cross, fucking dude. And Die Young, yeah. fucking, you know, just Children yeah. of the Sea, like all those, Heaven and Hell, like all those fucking. Incredible, incredible, incredible music, but like. You're maybe Go the back first. And, per, I think you're the first person who's ever yeah, people are just afraid to answered say it, this fucking. Who's honestly said this? You people know? are like, afraid to say it. Uh, it is like, like some people consider it blasphemy. <laughs> I don't give a fuck, dude. I don't care about that no, at all. I, I like what I tell my you ears. What, I fucking love those records. Some of two of my yeah, all-time favorite. They're incredible. I, I mean, mean, just go I'll, back. I mean, I'll go and, even farther. Heaven and Hell is the first Black Sabbath record I ever hear. So, dude, sure. I go backwards, you know, like that, sure. that's my introduction. So that's why I have such a fucking affinity to it, because that's the first set. I'm sitting there staring at the three angels smoking cigarettes going like, whoa, this is fucking evil. Like, what's this? Yeah. You know, and yep. I love it. And, and, then, and I mean, and then I go backwards. Do you remember that weird uh, song on there, that E5150 yes, song? Yes. Okay. Totally. So, wow. That, Hold right. That. Yeah. Just, Sick. it sounds like drugs. It just sounds like what drugs sound like. <laughs> totally. Right? Sounds like drugs. So, I remember <laughs> listening to that and just being like, fuck, man, this is crazy. Black Sabbath could have never pulled this off before. Like, this is such an interesting thing. And the way it built into the next song and how everything kind of like it crescendoed up into each other. It was musically like, if it wasn't called Black Sabbath, and it was called something else. People would have been insanely crazy about it. It would all the Black Sabbath fans would have been, oh, this new project that Bill Ward and Tony Iommi, like you know, Geezer Butler. This is so crazy. You have to check it out. It's a deal. But because it was called Black Sabbath, everybody was waving their dicks at it and being like, "Fuck this well, bullshit." You know what? You know? The, like at the time, you know, like a lot of people, like you know, again, the mythology thing, but you know. People were done with Black with Ozzy era Black Sabbath. Yeah. Those last two oh, yeah. records were stinkers. Oh, yeah. They just went on tour with Van Halen. Van Halen was blowing them off the fucking stage every night, which they did to most bands. We'll yeah. say and they fuck did to most bands. and then this new Sabbath thing, and it kind of gives them a second wind, right? Like it gives them this whole, mm-hmm. oh my god, they're cool again, and it's like heavy and you know modern and you know so yeah, like, it's it's like all the people that are like. Oh, do you like black metal? And I'm like, no. And they're like, well, why? And I'm like, have you ever listened to a black metal record? It just sounds like, Pfft. you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. there are black metal bands that I, I think are good and that have good records, but the majority of old black metal just sounds like somebody recorded it with a blow dryer in front of the microphone. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like everybody goes crazy for a- Bathory. And I was like, even back then, I was just like, this shit sucks. <laughs> No, I, like, I kind of oh. like some battery stuff, but like it's okay. It's, it's just like I like I like a couple. Of, there was a couple of songs I liked that, like in general, I wasn't like crazy about. Black, I wasn't really crazy about black metal until like I want to say like I started hearing like Cradle. You know, like that's when yeah. I was like, Whoa, well, that's okay, different. This is like that's fucking different. something else. You know, I think I think Behemoth takes the black and death metal thing to a whole new chart for sure. me. Oh, totally. Like, uh, like that slaves shall serve EP thing that they did back in the day. It was just like, to me, that's like the best version of that, like black and death metal thing. But I don't, I'm not a huge black metal guy and I get why people love it. I understand it, but that's the whole thing. Like the purists, it's got to sound terrible in order for me to like it. It's got to sound old. It's got to sound like it was recorded in a basement on a, my first Sony, you know, then, and then you get the new versions of that and people refuse to love it. They refuse to listen to it. So I feel like that's what happened with that, with that era of Black Sabbath. You know, the purists just right. refused. And like, you know, Tim's a huge Sabbath fan. And when I say that shit, it just gets him so mad at me for like three days. But like, whatever. I like what I like, you know. <laughs> and it, it just, people are going to say that, you know, it's like going to Germany. And, and you play in Germany and they go, your last record was not as good as the record before. You know what I mean? It's just, it breaks your heart, but I'd rather than be honest with me, you know? Lo- so- Tre- Trevor from Black Dahlia has the best th- saying about that. He's just like, your your new record is never, ever going to be as good as your record from Facts. seven years ago. Like in the metal Facts. community, like, it, like yeah. I'm about to drop a new record and 
everybody's gonna be like not as good as the last one you know, like, <laughs> i'll disagree i may i may have heard some of that and yeah. it is good it yeah. is good but like people are just like you know like it's 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 in some ways it, it, it's almost the opposite of rap in some ways you know like where everything new in rap is always better than anything old in a metal I can see it, that everything old is better than everything better new, than what is new you know? and yeah then, like, and then you know, and then in and time, then everybody says yeah yeah everybody says the same thing they're like man i never realized how great this record was five <laughs> years ago it's like fuck you man like it was fucking same you know decibel totally. magazine smashing us or giving us praise on stuff and then you know people go read it and they listen to it and they're like oh this is bullshit decibel doesn't know what they're talking about it's like and then five years later they tell you how awesome it was so right. well i failed as a musician now because nobody bought the record i couldn't pay my bills and uh so now i'm just gonna go on and work at fucking burger king or some shit now because my new record isn't as good as my old record you we know do, what i mean we just did a you know we do the electric happy hour every friday so we just we play and then we do like album playthroughs so like on the anniversary of an album we'll do a full album playthrough and it's pretty fucking rad like it's totally been mm -hmm. awesome to just revisit you know it takes you back to the time where you were writing the music and like you know to put you back in the headspace singing the words and playing the riffs and and uh so we did catharsis our last album was called catharsis it was it has some fucking awesome songs on it but you know it was kind of panned by critics and some people hated it and whatever we so we did the playthrough just back in january we did the full album playthrough and I can't even tell you how many motherfuckers like, what song is this? This is fucking sick. I've never heard this song before. Like, of where course. did this come from? Is this on that record? Yeah. Like, yeah, motherfucker, it's on that record. Yeah, it's it's just the way of the world, man. So so back to it. Ronnie James Dio okay. for the win. Okay. Sorry, Ronnie man. James Ronnie Dio James for Dio. the win. Okay. For the win. My, yep. oh, my. All right, what's your uh, <laughs> favorite Metallica record? Ooh, okay. It was Ride the Lightning and Injustice for All for One. That that, that era. Okay, that whole that trifecta of of records. Well, no, Ride Ride the Lightning and Injustice for All. Those two records. Oh, gotcha. Okay, not Masters. So, I mean, Masters is an amazing record, but Creeping Death was like when I heard that, I was like, oh man, this is something. And then they did a lot of weird stuff on that record. And then fast what forward record? on Ride the Lightning. Okay, yeah. And then fast forward. What was weird? Um, what did they do weird on there? I mean, they just took some chances musically that they had never done before. Okay. You know what I mean? There was a lot more harmonizing guitars. There was a lot more like goofy black. guitar solos. But yeah, like there was some clean stuff going on. There was songs with more emotion than just being like angry metal. They started to like become the Metallica that inevitably... You know, what about escape? Now. What about escape? Um, yeah, it's it's great. It's a great song. I mean, no, it, it is not a not, great song. You, hey, Patrick man. Sheridan, that is not a great Listen, song. All right, it's not their best work. We'll say that, but it's still a good song. And and there's got to be at least one stinker on every record, right? Out so on my own, out to be free. <laughs> Hey man, you everybody song, loves apparently. the everybody loves the black album, and that song could be on the black album, that and no one would blink your, an eye. Oh my god! Wow, no, I never thought no about one that. could blink an eye for that. That totally song true. could fit into that record, and no one would blink an eye. So anybody that talks bad it about that be, record, it might be one of the heaviest songs on the black album. If it was, on it the would black be. Album. Yeah. I'm not a black album fan. Really? If people get mad at me. I'm not a fan because think about. I was like a diehard Metallica fan. Like whenever anybody's like, oh, do a playthrough with a guitar with an old metal song, like right back to my Metallica riffs, right? Okay. So you you take this era of Metallica, you are, and Justice For All came out, this ripper from front to back. Mm. You name a bad song mm. on that I'll record. Name, I'll just fucking title drag. Too long. No way. Too no way. Long. Rob Flynn, you're not allowed to talk about writing long songs. Okay. So, so if you. See, I can though, because that song just goes on with the same riffs for 10 minutes too long. Let it go. It's perfect. It's like, it's a perfect song. So I'm just saying that to piss you off. I mean, that record is incredible. That's, that's my go grab a beer song. I got to say, like when they start playing. Fine, it gives you enough off. time to get up and stretch it out, dude. <laughs> so. I can go take a piss. But do you, you make beer, that record. Go talk to my homie. I mean, dude. That record is incredible. Blackened, shortest straw, freight ends of sanity, 
what's uh don't and Dyer's Eve. No, Harvest of Sorrow. Harvest of Sorrow. Harvest of Sorrow. Yeah. Yep, the two. Dyer's Eve. Dyer's Eve. Ridiculous. I mean, dude, that was a ripper, right? And then Unforgiven. Then you give me Unforgiven. That's where we're going from this. <laughs> from Dyer's Eve to Unforgiven. unforgiven. That's quite you know what I mean? though. <laughs> Yeah, what's, the, it was, what's the last song on the Black Album? Why don't you compare that? The last song on the Black Album versus the last song on uh, Injustice for All. I don't even know what the last song on the Black Album <laughs> I think is. It's, uh, Dyer Z is the last song on... I think it's through on, the Never. I think it's through the Never. Probably. Mm-hmm. And Dyer Z is the last track on that record, right? On mm-hmm. That's the very last track on Injustice for All. Ripper. And like, super ripper. I mean, if you don't have a right hand, don't even try to play that song. Okay, kill that's a, I actually did like a little video thing talking about the importance of that song when I had first really started digging into playing guitar and like the lessons I learned right hand wise, like, I mean, then we unforgiven. That's, that's where we go. And I mean, some of the songs have grown on me and there's a couple of good songs on that record, but like, that's the thing. Like if you think that that song escape is no good, you can't like one track on the black album. No, because the black album is awesome. Come on now. It's fucking great. Sandman, sad but true. Sad but true is a good song. Sad but true is a good song. I've said, like I've said, there's a handful. My my friend Misery. uh, Um, what's the other one? There's a bunch of fucking uh, wherever I my room bangers. Good song. You don't like, uh, and nothing else matters. No. Come on. You know what you nope. need to do? You need to drink two glasses of wine with your wife and then sing that to her. <laughs> if you ever fall off the wagon, just drink two glasses. Don't drink any more than that. Just drink like half a bottle of wine. You split a bottle of wine and then sing those lyrics to her and it'll be like the hottest sex you've ever had that night. <laughs> uh, it's terrible, dude. Terrible. I can't I can't get behind it. I mean, listen, I'm not mad at them. I, I, I love that they're the biggest metal band in the world. I love that they came from where they are to where they're at you now. Love Metallica, just, and you love Metallica. I love, I love Metallica. Just that record. If if that record came out maybe two records later and they had built up to that, I would probably love it, right? But like, I'm like, it was too quick. and then bam, I'm just knocked out cold on the ground, and like, <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? My favorite band sounds like Toad the Wet Sprocket. Like somebody, <laughs> I'm dying right now. Toad but the you know, Sprocket. It's just like I, I just I, I just lost interest really quick. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it and happens. By, for and me. by go, then it was probably like one of those pivotal moments in your life where like all this new heavy shit's coming out. It's like nineteen ninety, mm-hmm. you know, they're going soft. Now you're like I'm just I just discovered going harder shit. I discovered obituary and suffocation and morbid angel and all of these bands that were like ripping my face off. Right. And like and then uh, and then Wherever I May Roam is on the radio, radio right. for Metallica. And I was just like, man, this is going to be tough for me. And I was a kid, you know what I mean? 1990, I was 14, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, so for me, it just didn't make sense. I was like, all right, looks like I'm going back to my old thrash metal records. And then all of a sudden, this kid in high school, like, he's like, listen to this Amon Deicide demo thing that I have. And my brain just went, like oh my god like how do i not love this brand of music it was so aggressive and angry and evil sounding and i just remember being like i need to know about all these bands and for like the next 10 years like digging into like all of that and then like look at the string of records that came out in the 90s yeah you know if and and not just metal bands but hardcore bands hip-hop was like smashing oh, yeah, numbers yeah. dude like it was unbelievable in the early to mid 90s like i was listening to my record collection was crazy it was like morbid angel black sheep like uh right. like fucking mad ball was releasing incredible records in the 90s like all that war 100 demons like the northeast like metally hardcore thing was happening and then like and then like uh bum stiggity bum stiggity bum hum yeah hum, foo snickens <laughs> hell yeah dude I love fum, that stuff. Fum, so here i come like peter yeah. Piper. dude i love that stuff but that was like and i grew up 25 minutes from staten island and wu-tang was a thing right. that Wu-Tang took over was king king unbelievable like 
there was so much music to pay attention to. And then the town could just put out something that didn't grab me. So it's just, okay, on to the next thing, you know, but the whole world got it. I just didn't get it. So that's my fault, I guess, you know, but it, it, it's just, I don't, I don't know if people it's lie. Okay. About you can stuff. love Metallica and hate that record. You know, it's okay. I don't hate it. I, I say that I hate it just to piss people off. I don't hate it. It's just, it's not, it's, it's not, not your Metallica. It's not my Metallica. My Metallica is like spitting on the crowd and pouring beer in, on fans <laughs> and like saying fuck you to everybody and like, you know, stumbling off stage. And you know what I mean? Like I, that's my Metallica, but it, new Metallica is great. Their live performances are unbelievable. Would I pay to go see Metallica in a heartbeat? Yeah. You know, I would hope that they played all their old songs and yeah. I'd be that guy going, motherfuckers didn't play this, but like, you know, like, I, I Where's know. Dyer's I'm, Eve? Where's Dyer's yeah. Eve? What the fuck? The, the, they they'll never play that live, dude. No, that's a that's a you got to work out for a week before you play that song. I tell you what, they played uh, at I went to the 30th anniversary thing and they played Trapped Under Ice like second, <laughs> like second or third oh song God, on the set, dude. and I was just like, fuck yeah. <laughs> I mean, I remember learning how to play Jump in the Fire when yeah. I was a kid, and that like whole pentatonic thing, like just like because it was easy ish. And like learning how to play that stuff, like, you know, early, early Metallica and just thinking like, man, this is so sick. And then it developed and developed and developed and developed. And then all of a sudden I lost interest. But, and, and then I came, I come back around to it. I hear something and I'm like, oh, this is cool. This feels like the stuff that I like once in a while, but you know, it's. Do you, do you end up getting in like later on? Do you get into like that early 2000s like kill switch you know the kind of new wave of american heavy metal lamb of god chimera i yeah. love lamb of god yeah i love lamb of god like um as the palaces burn and ashes of the wake those two records are unbelievable and will worked at the studio where they recorded sacrament so okay. i got to like see that all kind of go down from like the oh, background wow. a little bit Red. and then like you know I, I i fucking love that band i do um chimera i got into a little bit um kill switch uh alive or still breathe or uh, alive or breathing or live or just, just breathing, breathing and yep. yeah that ferret records i think that was on and no, then that was on uh, Road Runner. the one before Road, that was ferret but that was real before that was fair yeah okay and then um and then uh end of heartache because i've known howard johnson forever howard jo uh howard jones. I mean, uh, yep. howard jones rather uh he used to play i was following his career since he was in i said i'll tell you why i said that but uh i've been following his career since he was in blood has been shed so mm -hmm. he was connecticut guy so we would always go see his old band and he's the nicest dude ever and then when he joined kill switch it was like everybody stopped and watched and i think that record's the best kill switch record to me and the heartache yeah, is the best you know howard jones is a fucking monster singer and uh and he's got that new light the torch band that he's mm -hmm. doing and that's really cool too so that guy's he's got pipes man fuck like, yeah, that, he does. that dude's got fucking pipes so um I, re I recorded him for the roadrunner united thing the dagger and fucking i was like jesus <laughs> the dude sings from his feet bro he just <laughs> it, it comes from the floor so much it's so full sounding it's crazy yeah, he doesn't need to layer vocals. He does like all of the all of it at once. It feels right. like you know what I mean. It's it's really crazy. But um, Howard, Howard was the guy. I mean, I saw Kill Switch engaged when Adam was playing drums for them. Oh, okay. Um, at, in Newark at some like big festival, and I knew immediately that they were going to be like a big deal. So I got into some of that stuff. But um. Were you, uh, like side a, note. were you like an in flames uh, at the gates guy at the gates at the gates takes it for me. Okay. Dude, like that gardens of grief record sounded like carcass, right? Like it was like carcass entombed, like, and then kind of towards where at the gates was going. But as they started to progress, um, I, I was blown away by the whole melodic death metal thing and like slaughter the soul, terminal spirit disease, like all those records, um, what is it with fear i kiss the burning darkness is that the name of that record or something like that it's like a long one like all of those records did it for me you know and um i just remember i saw that band on their reunion tour like three times when they first came back and like started playing again and i was so blown away because i saw i also got into like sugar a lot 
Mm-hmm. And I saw all those bands play. Like I saw At The Gates play, I think at the Wetlands on like their first tour here. And then I saw them play at Irving Plaza and it was like the cleanest, most perfect thing I've ever seen. Wow. And then I saw... I saw Meshuggah play at Coney Island High in New York City. Oh, that was a, I just had Martin on here. That's a big, you know, that was like a big deal for them, that show. Dude, Their first they, American we were, appearance, yeah. Yeah, we were like jumping on stage and like singing along, you know, like like we do in, in the States. And they were so blown away by that because they never really experienced anything like that because they'd never been over here. Yeah. And the kids are like grabbing the microphone and flipping off, off the ceiling. You know, it was, it was Dillinger. Who was it? Dillinger, Meshuggah. Who else was on that tour? I can't remember. We were just talking about it. It was like, it was a pretty crazy tour. And I just remember maybe Candiria played. I can't remember. Oh, it was Candiria. I just talked about this with Martin last week. So yeah, it was Candiria. Yeah. Right. Can- also a very underrated band. Totally. Dude. Yeah, we played Carly is an incredible band singer. Band. That band rules, right? So I just remember seeing all these bands when they were babies and then seeing them years later and watching how like seasoned and incredible they were. I would say, I would say for sure more an at the gates guy than an in flames guy, but I, I like some in flames stuff, not, not as much as at the gates, but I do like in flames a lot. They're, they're a really good band. Right on. Right on. Yeah. I was just wondering like if all that stuff, we took Meshuggah on their first tour over in, I know you mentioned the that. on the burn my eyes tour. They, uh, yeah, that was cool. And they and it's funny because he talks about that. Like it didn't happen over in Europe. Like, you know, when they came over here, they were like, oh, my God, people are crazy for us over here. You know, yeah. like, so he really like did it. But I was I was freaking out on the Nun EP. I was just like, I want to take this band out. <laughs> like, Dude, this is sick. This is so fucking that, ridiculous. That band is so out of hand. Like some of the stuff is so crazy. And I remember my first exposure to the band was Destroy Race and Proof. Right. So that was my first exposure. And then going back and hearing the stuff where like when they did like that contradictions collapse record, it kind of sounded like a heavier Metallica. Yeah. And like they evolved into they did the reverse of what Metallica did. They evolved into something that I'm like completely blown away by. Right. And like I remember hearing those records and just being like, what the fuck is this? Like this can't be real. And then uh, New Millennium Sinai Christ, like the first time I heard that song. I couldn't get up out of the chair. Like I couldn't, I was like, what the fuck is going on right now? And then chaos fear came out and that corridor chameleon song, like that melted my brain. And then that catch 33 record is crazy. That, that song, I, that 23 minute long journey into hell. Like that song is like, they're, I mean, pound for pound carcass, Meshuggah at the gates, are probably and death are like my four like favorite four of death metal yeah of death metal metal. not even death metal like i don't even i don't even know what it is it's almost like prog it's like so different from everything else it's like the heaviest prog metal you've ever heard in your life you know what i mean right but like i don't know i i I had that's in that era though like that's like 95 96 slaughter the soul came out Right. right I, I mean, I want to say 95. I heard, yeah. it, I heard, it. I heard it. for me, I didn't, I never got into at the gates. I kind of missed it. I don't know what the deal was. I heard the haunted and at the gates on Barney Greenway from napalm death plays me at the gates and the haunted on the same day. And I instantly just thought, Oh my God, the haunted is fucking sick. And so I just went down the haunted path. Yeah, I like both. And Dude, apparently the, the everybody haunted. else, everybody else went down the at the gates path. <laughs> But well, I that haunted made me do it record. Yes, that first that, fucking that, record so fucking that, pissed. Fuck, dude, that first okay. like the intro track on that record. Hate song. I saw them at the yeah, I saw them at the Birch Hill, and it was that was just a fight. It was a fight for their whole set. Yeah. It was like when the smoke cleared, people were like picking up limbs and walking away. You know <laughs> what I mean? But yeah, I love I love that band too. That's a great band. I think that's a band a lot of people forget, and then when somebody mentions it, you're like, oh my god. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I've been asking a lot of people this uh, question and it's kind of just random and not, you, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but you know, I just been asking it. It's fu- It's just kind of a funny thing to me. So I've been asking a people like, what's the, 
what is the music that they're listening to when they lose their virginity? Or if there was a movie playing in the background? Uh, so let me tell you right now, so many people have answered Slayer in the background. I was just like, Slayer? I was like, really? Yeah. I was like, that is not romantic music or anything. Like, But they're like, I don't know why it was on, but it is perfect. You know, like Red Hot Chili Peppers. Red Hot Chili Peppers. All right. Yeah, nice. Yeah, Which, yeah Red Hot Chili the Peppers. Song or the album or the song? Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you're talking like early 90s. Right, right. Yep. That's a good one. Yeah. Do you remember a particular song? No, I don't remember no, all that. Just, just the album. <laughs> I <remember all laughs> yeah, that. I just remember the album. I was I was a fucking baby, but yeah. How old yep. are you? Uh, I don't remember, like 14, 13, yeah. 14. <laughs> 14. Yeah, way too right. young. And Blood Sugar Sex Magic. I, I could see... Like in my in my mind, that should have been the record that everybody was losing their degree. Like every song about fucking sex. Like it is like, sex or heroin. Sex or fucking. I mean, it's just, or, drugs or, or just, drugs or pleasure. You know, like it's just even yeah. about just pleasure. Like to me, like that's what that totally makes sense to me that everybody that you're losing your virginity to that record. But yeah, like Slayer absolutely. at dawn they sleep. I'm like at dawn they sleep. Yeah. Like okay. what kind of. What's your partner like? What's your what's your partner like that that's what you guys chose? I yeah. mean, I think it's pretty sick. You know what I mean? Frank like, from Metal Injection put... said uh, uh, 311 because that's what she <laughs> And I was just like, okay, that's okay. Awesome. That, that oh, works. Yeah. That works, you know. <laughs> Amber is the color of her energy. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. God, what a weird one. Yeah. I had to throw yeah, that man. out. I had to throw. I, but yeah. part of the, the question comes because Lars Ulrich, uh, he and I have always, always had this funny conversation there. Where he thinks that the reason that everybody loves the Black Album still all these days, like because they lost their virginity to the Black Album. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> or, I mean, saying, that's, that's why it continues to sell. You know, fucking five thousand records a week every it's single. It's so week. crazy, dude. It's so crazy. Yeah. Good 30, for that. Thirty-one years later, it's still selling. You know, like insane you think about those records like you think about those catalog records that like we don't even, we're we're talking about like our first work first week scans and all this some of these record dark Eight. side of the moon uh the, the black album back in black like the albums yeah. do three to seven thousand records a week every and they, week and every they came out 50 year. years ago yeah 50 yeah. fuck it, you know black albums 31 years old 31 now. years old yeah yep God. and it's still selling more a week than my record sold first week like, right it kills yeah. me, dark side of the kills dark me. side of the moon is like almost 50 years it, i think it's 50 next year it's 50 years old next yeah. year dark side of the moon it's crazy and fuck it's crazy it, it sells more than the black album every week yeah it's, it's nuts you know like nuts yeah. stuff dude it is it's, it's good shit this has been a great. Uh, this has been a great conversation, ma'am. What a roller coaster! Every time we talk, it's a roller coaster, dude. It's <laughs> up and down, up and down. I love it. Yeah, I love man. it totally. I I love it too. We've been talking for two and a half hours. I know. It's pretty fucking. I weird. can't believe it. I looked at my watch. I was like, "Holy shit, it's five thirty. You probably got to take a pit. <laughs> no. I do have to pee really bad. Okay. <laughs> I will. On that note, then I will let you go. Uh, wait, you know what? I actually wanted to ask you one more thing, and this will be the final question of the thing, of the podcast. Do you? fart in bed and does it annoy your wife um no i, I mean i'm sure i fart in bed but um my wife is like in the middle of the, the night greatest I mean. at, at, in the middle of the night no, no i don't know we both sleep like champions dude so okay. i'm not i'm not waking up for that but um my wife doesn't really complain about too much that i do so when i fart I, I say I'm sorry, and she's like, it's fine. And then she goes, Jesus Christ, and then it's over. You know what I mean? So I'm pretty lucky. <laughs> the reason I brought this up is because last night I ate, like, beans. I had a lot of vegetables yesterday, and then I had, like, my dinner was, like, chicken and beans or something like that. And fucking, mm -hmm. dude, I was, <laughs> far, I was ripping farts like and like Jesus even Christ. i was jo i was joking with us today because i was just like i think you're asleep but you can hear me fart in your sleep and then you just kind of grow like uh, no. like you kinda roll <laughs> she's like no i was fucking awake for some of those farts and i goddamn heard you she's like what the fuck dude and i was like i love that <laughs> oh, gross i was like i'm sorry i had to get up and take a gas x in the middle of the night just to stop because i would probably <laughs> wake you up at some point she's like what the fuck just hold it i'm like i can't i was laying on my stomach 
<laughs> Remind me to make sure that if we ever go on tour together and share a bus, I get the bunk as far away from you as I possibly can. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> You don't want to catch me after I've had my morning protein powder. Fucking look at I'm it. good. I'm good, dude. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, right there. That was the mighty, mighty, mighty Patrick Sheridan. Fit for an autopsy. Peace out. <laughs>